Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Oh, yes, we are at it again, still, constantly, every day, coming at your ears. I record four or five days a week. Um, usually I try to record two episodes a day, four times a week. So I record eight in a week uh, because they're airing seven episodes a week. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I have to adjust that. I don't know why I'm telling you this. I just thought you might want to know. That's a little sneak peek into my life. Okay, the first word in this episode, the top of page two, no, 353. It is the prefix dipple or diplo, D-I-P-L or D-I-P-L-O. Number one, double or twofold, as in diplopia. And uh, when we'll, we'll see diplopia, I think that's the last word of this episode. And then number two, the it means diploid, as in the example, diplophase or diplophase. And we will see diplophase here, and we will also see diploid. Yes, this is a fun D-I-P-L-O section, diplo. Anything that starts with diplo just sounds fun to me. Um, yeah, the, the, the etymology, it's from the Greek word diplus, which doesn't say what it means, but it probably means double or twofold. And there's more at the word double. Oh, so in that case, I think our sound effect is going to be... Meep, meep. Next, we have diplegia. D-I-P-L-E-G-I-A. Noun from circa 1881. Paralysis of corresponding parts on both sides of the body. So if both of your arms are paralyzed, both of your legs are paralyzed, both of your ears are paralyzed, both of your noses are paralyzed, we could go on. Uh, In that case, because it's both, it's two, uh, that's where the DI prefix comes in, diplegia. You don't want diplegia or monoplegia or any kind of plegia. You know, if you, it's better to have one thing paralyzed than both things paralyzed. That's what I always say. Next word. Boop, boop. Diploblastic. Diploblastic. Adjective from circa 1885. Having two germ layers. And this is used of an embryo or lower invertebrate lacking a true mesoderm. It's very sad when they lack a true mesoderm. It's got two germ layers. It is diploblastic. Next. Burp, burp. Diplococcus. D-I-P-L-O-C-O-C-C-U-S. Diplococcus. Now, I'm going to assume that we are using the diplo prefix in practically all of these words here. Maybe not all of them. Uh, So it probably means double or twofold. But double or twofold of what? Um, Noun from circa 1881. Any of various encapsulated bacteria that usually occur in pairs. That's the the double part. And that were formerly grouped in a single taxon, but are now all assigned to other genera or genera. Hmm. Hmm. So examples of, we got a couple of things to say here. Examples of these encapsulated bacteria would be Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a common cause of pneumonia. And then where it says they were formerly grouped in a single taxon, the genus there is also just Diplococcus. Uh, And I think we may have to put a link in the show notes so we can get a bit more information because it was a bit confusing here. But it's basically bacteria and there's pairs of them. Maybe they're going on the boat in a line two by two. And uh, yeah, that's Diplococcus. Next, me me. Diplodocus or Diplodocus. D I P L O D O C U S. Noun from 1884. Any of a genus of large herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs of the late Jurassic, known from remains 
found in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Utah. So basically, the like the near west of the United States, not the far west. That would be like California, Oregon, Washington. This is sort of the near west. So uh, that's generally where they lived, or at least where they found the bones of these guys, these uh, these Diplodocuses, Diplodoci. And the genus is Diplodocus, and they're herbivorous, so they eat the plants. They lived in the late Jurassic period. So what? where did this name come from? Well, we have the Diplo, or the Dipple prefix, and also the Greek word dokos, which means beam, B-E-A-M. Also from dekesthai, which means to receive. None of this is making any sense. Akin to the Latin desere, which means to be fitting. And there's more at the word decent. So again, we need to put a link in the show notes for Diplodocus and probably po- post some pictures of them on social media so we can see what they look like. They have two of something, I think. Two of what? I don't know. Do they have beams? Do they shoot laser beams out of their eyes? I don't think so. That would be cool if they did, but no, probably not. Okay, the next word. Mimi. Diploe. <laughs> this is a fun word. Diploe. It just looks like it's pronounced diplo. Diplo? It's, it's uh, diploe. D-I-P-L-O-E. Noun from 1597. Cancellous bony tissue between the external and internal layers of the skull. Okay, so cancellous, C-A-N-C-E-L-L-O-U-S. I don't know exactly what that is. You'd think that any word that I have already read in this book I would remember, but clearly... That is not the case. I think we got to go do a quick little check for... I don't think anything's being canceled. And it's not cancer. Uh, Oh, I think I went one page too far. Let's see. C-A-N... Oh, we went a couple of pages too far. Let's see. Cancelous. 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 What? Whatever could this mean? Well, there's cancel, cancellation, cancellous. Here we go. Um, having a porous structure. So if the bone has a porous structure, structure, it is cancellous. I'll try to remember that next time I'm talking to my doctor about my bones. Um, so it's a tissue, but it's kind of bony and it is porous. It's between the external and the internal layers of the skull. So there's... There's some sort of, maybe this is like a padding of some kind. If you get hit in the head, it's going to hit the external layer and then the, then the, then the diploe and then the internal layer. And hopefully it's uh, keeping you protected. Hmm. Uh, diploic or diploic. That is an adjective. And yeah, it's, it just means double. So maybe it's like a double layer thing or it's double because it's in the middle of two layers, the double layers, it's between them, maybe? Sure, why not? We're just making stuff up as we go. The next word, I think we'll just keep with the uh, with the roadrunner. Meep, meep. Diploid. First form, adjective from 1908. So this was one of the definitions of the prefix diple or diplo it means diploid we do have two forms here so what is it the first form is having two haploid sets of homologous chromosomes as in diploid somatic cells two haploid cells that's the double that's about all i can gather diploidy diploidy is a noun and I think you emphasize the di, diploidy. A very, very, very fun word to say. Diploid and diploidy. Oh, that's filled with um, diphthongs. There's, it, not filled with, there's only one, oid. The O-I, oi, that's a diphthong. Next, meep, meep. diploid, second form, noun from also 1908, a single cell 
individual or generation characterized by the diploid chromosome number. And, uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't know enough about the chromosomes to give you any more information. I wish, I wish I could. But there's two things happening. Next. Mm -hmm. Diploma. D-I-P-L-O-M-A. Noun from 1622. I'm very curious to see what the etymology has to say. So the plural is diplomas, but in number one, the plural is could also be diplomata or just dipl- dipla diplomata? Dip- diplomata. I think that's how you say it. It is an, uh, an official or state document, and the synonym is charter. Just any official document is a diploma, and if there's more than one, it's a diplomata. Number two, a writing usually under seal conferring some honor or privilege. It's been sealed up. There's some important information in this diploma. Three, a document bearing record of graduation from or of a degree conferred by an educational institution. If you have graduated from anything, you might have gotten a diploma from kindergarten up through any level of college. I hope you got a diploma. Uh, I don't even remember if I got a diploma when I... There's an 8th grade graduation. Definitely got one for high school and college. Took me a little while to finish college, though. And, uh, yeah, tells you you finished. And uh, if you have a a specific degree, a specific thing, it's going to mention that as well. And uh, you, you know, you should, you should definitely show these proudly to people who come over to your place. Make sure you have your diplomas up on your wall where everybody can see them. And so they know where you went, where you came from, what'd you do, what'd you study, all that fun stuff. This is a Latin word, actually, diploma, and it means passport or just diploma. Uh, From the Greek word diploma which means folded paper or passport. Uh, That is probably more of the number two definition where it's under seal. Um, And also from diploon, which means to double, like maybe when it's folded, it's doubled. Is that literally where we get this word from? They folded the piece of paper in half, so it's been doubled, and then they sealed it. And that's, that's the word diploma. I was genuinely curious if the diplo prefix was going to mean double here. And I was like, there's no way. It must be something else. Oh, oh, that is so funny to me. Ha 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 ha. Meep, meep. The next word is diplomacy. Noun from 1796. I am going to guess that this is related to the number two definition for diploma because it's It seems like, or maybe the number one, actually, that one makes more sense. The official or state document or a charter. So, diplomacy. One, the art and practice of conducting negotiations between nations. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, that's what it is. You got to have good diplomacy if the nations are talking, especially if they're maybe not so happy with each other. You got to be very careful with your diplomacy talking between them. Maybe you need a a third party, a mediator. Number two, skill in handling affairs without arousing hostility. Let's, Let's keep the hostility to a minimum. Let's not arouse any hostility. Let's just keep this conversation chill, man. The synonym is the word tact. Now, this doesn't have to be talking between two nations. Uh, It's just really dealing with any situation keeping it chill if you got good good diplomacy you are you are avoiding hostility it didn't say anything about the etymology or the diploma i am now very curious about the the, the etymology my guess is that the diplo prefix has to do with the two the two nations the two sides who are dealing with the thing uh that's that's what i think it is the next word. Meep, meep. Diploma mill. 
two words. The second word is M-I-L-L. Noun from 1914, a usually unregulated institution of higher education granting degrees with few or no academic requirements. Basically, you go in, you you do your school in, they just, they'll let in everybody. You do good enough, they're going to give you a diploma. It's a diploma mill. It's kind of like a slang way to call maybe a college that isn't quite, uh, it's not quite so reputable. It says it's unregulated. So you probably don't want to go to a place like this. That's my guess. The next word. Meep, meep. Diplomat. Noun from 1813. One employed or skilled in diplomacy. They do the diplomacy. They keep things chill and not hostile. And we have, eh, you know what? Not really any etymology here either. It's French. Diplomat or diplomatique. But that's it. The diplomat does diplomacy. And is this one connected? Me me. Diplomate. We put an E at the end. Noun from 1879. A person who holds a diploma. <laughs> That's very simple, but there's a whole lot more. Especially, a physician qualified to practice in a medical specialty by advanced training and experience in the specialty followed by passing an intensive examination by a national board of senior specialists. So generally, anybody who has a diploma is a diplomate, but more specifically and probably more often, it is used to describe somebody who has gone through a lot of schooling and has taken a hard test and passed the test, and then they are uh, a diplomate. Specifically physicians, medical people. Next. Meep, meep. Diplomatic. Adjective from 1711. Number 1A, the synonym is paleographic. Now, I would think that that would deal with maybe dinosaurs, digging, paleontology, something like that. Not sure exactly what the paleo prefix means, now that I think about it. But diplomatic is also paleographic. 1B, exactly reproducing the original. Diplomatic, as in a diplomatic edition. And again here, I believe the diplo prefix means double because you're making a copy of the original. You've now got a double. Two, for a diplomatic, of relating to or concerned with diplomacy or diplomats, as in diplomatic relations, keeping everything cool, man. Three, employing tact and conciliation especially in situations of stress. I would like to think that especially if I'm not completely involved in a stressful situation, I can be diplomatic. I think I'm pretty good at that. I think I'm pretty good at uh, helping to diffuse a situation, helping to get people to understand each other better. Uh, sometimes you gotta you gotta adjust you got to translate from one person to the other person and you got to be cool and i am often pretty cool and collected and not stressed most of the time <laughs> this synonym is suave i don't know if i would say i'm ever suave but i i see i see the connection there diplomatically is an adverb and let's see we already talked a little bit about the etymology that i thought of but this is specifically from Latin diploma, which, uh, oh, in, in number one, paleographic and also re reproducing the original, it is from the Latin diploma. Um, and then in the other senses, it is from the French diplomatique, which is connected with documents regulating international relations. That is that stuff. Yeah, great stuff. The next word, me me, diplomatist, noun from 1768. The synonym is just diplomat. I guess let's see. Diplomat was 1813, and diplomatist was 1768. So it was about 50 years or so earlier. 
The edip- diplomatist is the older word. Mimi. Next is diplophase. Diplophase. D i p l o p h a s e, and diplophase is the example for the diplo prefix where it means diploid, and diplophase is the example. So it's something about diploid. Um, it is a noun from circa 1925, a diploid phase in a life cycle. And the diploid, it was about two haploid sets of homologous chromosomes or a thing being characterized by the diploid chromosome number. And uh, the diploid phase in a life cycle. What is the diploid phase? I think we, if, if I didn't do it before, I'm going to do it now. Put a link in the show notes for diploid and diplophase because I think there's there's some good information that we should probably know about. Hmm. <laughs> All right. We are now on our last word, and uh, it is... Mimi. Diplopia. Diplopia. Such a fun word to say. And this was the example in the other definition for the diplo prefix, which means double or twofold. Diplopia. D-I-P-L-O-P-I-A. Noun from circa 1811. A disorder of vision in which two images of a single object are seen as from unequal action of the eye muscles. So the eye muscles are acting up differently. The muscles are, are not the same as each other. They should be the same. And so you see two images of the same thing. It's also just called double vision. I got double vision. It wouldn't have worked so well if they said, I got diplopia, diplopia, diplopic, diplopic or diplopic is an adjective. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, the etymology. And uh, so what, what causes this? I mean, yes, if the eye muscles are not not working the same, um, is that literally what's happening if you see double of a thing that the eye, I don't know, I feel like there's, hmm... It's fascinating. Uh, you know, if somebody's drunk, there's the there's the stereotypical thing of them seeing double. Uh, hmm, interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll put a link in the show notes for diplopia as well. All right, it is time to reread the words. And we've got to pick a word of the episode. So we had dipl, or diplo, diplegia, is about paralysis, diploblastic, it's the two germ layers, diplococcus, this is the bacteria, diplodocus is the dinosaur, uh, diploe, this is the bony tissue in the skull, diploid and diploid, that's about chromosomes, diploma, diplomacy, diploma mill, diplomat, diplomate, diplomatic, diplomatist or diplomatist, diplophase, and diplopia. Well, diplopia is a very fun word. So is diploid and diploe and all of them pretty much. Diplodocus. So let's see, which one do we really want to pick as the word of the episode? Uh, Let's see, I'm thinking of either probably diplopia or probably, probably diplomacy? I think maybe diplomacy is a good one. Yeah, I think I think it's just good to have diplomacy. It doesn't have to be about a political situation. Just between, you know, you and your partner or your partners or your relations, your family, your friends. I think it's just good to have diplomacy in general. So, uh, yeah. Have some diplomacy when you're talking with the people. Diplomacy is a really good thing to have. That's a fine place to end this song. I just like singing for some reason. But the songs are really dumb. I don't like them. Okay. Yeah, diplomacy. That's going to be the word of the episode. And that is going to be the end of the wordy part of the episode. And I will quickly say some movies that we've been watching. Because I don't know if you like it, but I've been saying it sometimes. Um, Did I mention Mixed Nuts? 
don't remember. Mixed Nuts. Never seen it. It's a very uh, very silly movie. Scrooged. Hadn't seen Scrooged in uh, 20, 25 years. Great late 80s version of A Christmas Carol with Bill Murray. Batman Returns. Hadn't seen that also in 25 or 30 years. Oh, yeah. That's a crazy, fun Tim Burton Batman movie. Uh, don't open till Christmas. I didn't, this is a weird movie and we were watching it. Uh, Joe Bob's drive in on shutter. It's a Christmas old Christmas horror movie and it's very strange and weird and I feel like I need this. And I think I fell asleep near the end. So I think I need to watch that straight through again. Uh, the apology modern Christmas kind of horror movie. Uh, that's a, that's worth a watch spirited. Oh, spirited. Yet another modern take on A Christmas Carol. This one just came out this year, 2022. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, Will Ferrell, a whole bunch of other great people. And uh, so much fun and a great message. And uh, it's on, uh, we watched it on Apple. Great, great time. And then lastly, Office Christmas Party. You know, I'm in uh, I'm in the middle end of December. So we've been watching a bunch of holiday movies. Uh, Office Christmas Party is just a raunchy raunchy fun crazy time as you would expect all right that is a fine place to end this uh this this is uh this is this is the end my friend i don't know what's well, yeah we got we got some fun stuff coming up okay thank you very much for listening and until next time this is spencer dispensing information goodbye Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Uh, First off, go to TikTok at Speedjampar to see something something different. I'm not even going to describe what it is. Uh, Yeah, we we got to read the word. The first word is diplopod, D-I-P-L-O-P-O-D, noun from circa 1864. The synonym is millipede because they got two of the pods the diplo double pod foot uh yeah that's uh that's what the etymology says let's end this tick tock thing clickety clickety clackety kluk all right so uh the millipede we're not going to get to learn more about the millipede until uh very oh my god the stupid tick tock Long, long time ago is when we'll hear millipede and get to learn what millipede is. But yeah, basically they got uh, two, they, they they got many, many sets of double feet, one on either side of their body, just like humans do. Most humans, we, we, we are kind of diplopods because we got a pair, we got a double feet. Yeah, yeah, humans and millipedes, they're the same thing. Oh, I did not think of a sound effect ahead of time, so I, I sort of try to do something kind of maybe related to a word in the episode. Um, I don't know if there's anything real great here. Uh, I, I got an idea. Um, I will say, though, there is, there is a word later this episode that uh, some people might say is, uh, is uh, adult, explicit, whatever the hell. But, um, you know, we just don't really care about that here on this show because they're just words. Uh, If there is an extended interview, uh, if a a guest is on and uh, we talk for a lot, a long time about a a certain adult topic, I I will probably set that to explicit. Uh, Karen O'Leary, Sarah Dysack, both of those were explicit. But, you know, for a word like dipshit, we're not going to label that as explicit. If you want me to ex- uh, tag it as explicit, then you are a dipshit. No, I'm just being silly, but sometimes we have to say the swear words because they're fun to say. All right, it is time for a sound effect, which is... The next word is dipletine. It's going to be double something. Noun from 1925. A stage of meiotic prophase, which follows the pacotine, and during which the paired homologous chromosomes begin to separate and chiasmata become visible. I felt like I was reading another language. Diplotine is also an adjective. 
Um, okay, so we got meiotic prophase follows the pacotine. Pacotine, by the way, is spelled P-A-C-H-Y-T-E-N-E. The paired homologous chromosomes begin to separate. Uh, that's I can understand that. The chromosomes chromosomes begin to separate and chiasmata. C H I A S M A T A. It begin. It becomes visible. So is the chiasmata on the inside of the chromosome meiotic prophase? I think, if I remember correctly from biology class, meiosis is that when a cell splits? Maybe I don't know. There's something in my brain that's making me. Well, it does make sense because the chromosome begins to separate. So that I, I can justify that. Hopefully, I'm right. Um, yeah, I don't know what the pacotine is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't give you anything else. Sometimes my brain isn't listening when it's reading or thinking. It it needs more than one time to fully hear or understand something. So going back, I hope you're the same way. Going back and listening, thinking, reading, concentrating hard really helps. Diplotine. The next word. Dip net, two words, noun from 1820. A bag net with a handle that is used especially to scoop fish from the water. (laughs) Uh, Dip net is a transitive verb. Let's go dip netting and get some fish with a dip net. So is this the thing, (laughs) the scoopy net thing that people have at their house when they have fish? You gotta scoop out the fish sometimes if you got to clean the tank you got to move them into another tank or maybe you got to take them to the vet or maybe there's a dead one and you got to scoop it out maybe there's too much poop maybe i don't know what else is in the aquarium but sometimes you got to scoop them out and it is called i guess the dip net which makes sense because it's netting and it dips into the water usually not too far but sometimes you got to get it down in there Maybe you're trying to catch a fast fish and it's a hard job. Dipnet. Next word. Dipnowin or dipnowin. That's like practically the same thing. Dipnowin, dipnowin. D-I-P-N-O-A-N. Okay. Dipnowin is a noun from 1883. The synonym is lungfish. Is this the one where they pulled it up from the water, the deep, deep water, and it looks like a sad old cartoon man or something? And they're like, this is the ugliest fish ever. Well, it's because you took it out of its pressurized home. This is what I learned from a science podcast, probably ologies. And uh, you took it out of its pressurized home down deep in the water, and it looked fine then. And now it's in this unpressurized place, and it feels very uncomfortable for the fish. So that's why it looks so silly. I don't know if that is a lungfish. We will need to put a link in the show notes for Dipnowin, a.k.a. the lungfish. Uh, This is from the Greek Dipnous which means having two breathing apertures, which is from di plus pnoi, which means breath, from plain, which means to breathe. <sighs> oh, we all need to remember to breathe. I sometimes don't. There's more of the word sneeze. Hachu, that would have been a good good uh, sound effect for this episode. Uh, lung fi- so two breathing apertures is this saying it has two lungs does it have two nostrils two holes in which to breathe from i'm not exactly sure of these aperture i would think it's the hole the aperture like our nostril would be a breathing aperture um and i guess that's why i call it lungfish is it a transition fish from the water fish to the land animals and it has lungs and other fish don't have lungs? I feel like I should know this, but I don't. So let's let's look it up on the Wikipedia and put the, put the link in the show notes. And um, I had something else to say about it and I don't remember. Dipnoin lungfish. Dipody is next. D I P O D Y, noun from circa 1844. A 
prosodic unit of measure of two feet or measure of two feet. A prosodic unit or measure of two feet. So is this literally talking about two feet, 24 inches? I guess that length is a dippity. What? Why would you do this? Why would you name this? Dipodic is an adjective. Unless it's something else about the foot, feet, the feet at the bottom of your legs with the toes. Is it those two feet? Uh, This is from Greek dippos, which means having two feet. Yeah, two feet. Similar to diplopod, diplo is double, and di is two. It's basically the same thing. I mean, a a dip a dipity dipity. It's just a funny word too. They just added a y to dipod, dipity. Okay, whatever you say. Let's move on. Hey hey hey. Ooh, you, you, you. Dipole, d i p o l e. It's probably, oh, yes, oh, I was literally just going to say the thing that I saw in the definition accidentally, so I'm not even going to say it. Noun, from 1912, 1A, a pair of equal and opposite electronic charges or magnetic poles of opposite sign separated especially by a small distance, a very short distance. So they're equal and opposite electric charges or magnetic poles. So does that mean that it's, wait, how equal and opposite? So is it two north or two south or one north and one south? I would think it's the one north and one south. Dipole. It's got the two poles. Yeah, that's probably the north and the south. So would the earth be dipole or is it a dipole? Well, there's not a small distance between them. So does it have to be? It says especially by a small distance. Okay, 1B is a body or system, as a molecule, having such charges or poles. So, the electric the electric charges or magnetic poles, if a thing has that, it can be called also a dipole. Okay, so yeah, the pair of the poles or the charges is the dipole, and then the thing that has that pair of poles or charges is also the dipole. Number two. A radio antenna consisting of two horizontal rods in line with with each other and with their ends slightly separated. Well, the first thing I thought of was the antenna that you put on the top of your house in the 80s, probably the 70s and the 90s. I don't know how far back they go. No, they go probably pretty far back, right? 30s? 40s? No, no, there wasn't really TV then. 50s, maybe the 50s. Okay. So, it's, uh, I remember seeing, you know, it's got multiple poles sticking off of it, and I think two of them would have been horizontal, um, and they're in line with each other with their ends slightly separated. Um, yeah, maybe one of them is longer than the other. It's a dipole. They must, it must have two of those charges or poles. Dipolar is an adjective. Dipole moment, noun from 1926. The moment produced by a magnetic or electric dipole, especially the product of the distance between the two poles and the magnetic of either pole. I don't know what we're talking about. It's just electricity and magnetism, which I think is fascinating, but I really don't know anything about it and can't describe it to you any further, so you have to go learn about it on your own. Sorry. (laughs) Dipper is next. Noun from 1611. I think this is the longest word in the whole episode. Number one for dipper is one that dips. Just a Danny sort of dip. It dips, it's a dipper. Dippy dip, 1A. So one that dips as 1A. A worker who dips articles. What? Dips articles? I don't remember anything about an article when I read the word dip. I mean, there was a sheep dip, and there's the dip for the food, and let's see, your mortgage... 
And uh, was there any article dip plunging a thing into a thing? Huh, snuffing or, or dipping snuff. I don't know what this article is. I feel like there's a lot of uh, me not knowing things in this episode. Okay, well, let's try 1B. Something as a long-handled cup used for dipping. Really, any sort of spoon-shaped thing is a dipper. You can use it as a dipper. But there are some that are better. You know, a ladle, because the spoon shape is uh, perpendicular to the to the holding, what is it, the, uh, the hand, the handle... It's perpendicular to the handle. Uh, th- that's a better dipper. You're gonna be able to scoop up more. But if your if your handle and your spoon shape are all in line with each other, you're, it's gonna be very hard to dip. One C. It is slang for pickpocket. And yes, uh, just the word dip itself, the noun was also slang for pickpocket. So they were called dips or dippers because they would dip into your pockets, and pick at them. They would pick it, pick it, pick and pick. Number two, any of a genus of birds that comprise an ocine family and include individuals that wade and dive into swift mountain streams in search of food. Called also water ousel. O-U-Z-E-L. I have never heard of a water ousel or a dipper for that matter. Uh, it's not like I'm a birder. I just know a handful of birds. So the genus name is Synclus, uh, especially the name, oh, I guess it's Synclus Synclus. And that is of the Old World. And then also Synclus Mexicanus is of North America. So these are a couple examples of this dipper bird also called water ousel. Oh, and the family name is Synclidae. So it says that they they wade and dive into swift mountain streams. So they swim in the stream, and they're flying around them. What sort of food are they eating? Is it fish in the stream? Is it insects, maybe? Hmm. Let's put a link in the show notes, I guess. The next word is dippy. Adjective from 1899. And the other forms are dippier and dippiest, which I just think is funny. Is that dippier than that? No, no. I've said this joke before, but it's just every once in a while you get a good word that you're like, I never thought of the the E-R or the E-S-T forms of that word. Never thought about that. Dippy, dippier, dippiest. The synonym is just foolish, so I definitely feel like I am the dippiest of podcast hosts. Dippiness is a noun. Spencer has so much dippiness. He is a dip and, uh, and oh, and also, he's a dipshit. One word, noun from 1962. This is usually vulgar, no shit. And it is a stupid or incompetent person. Don't be a dipshit. Use your brain, you dippy. I mean, what else can you really say about the word dipshit? It's just a very good word, a fun thing to call people, and it's very satisfying to say dipshit. Next. <laughs> Dipso. Noun from 1880, one affected with dipsomania which probably isn't a good thing, so I shouldn't have said it like that. It's the next word, dipsomania. Dipsomania. Or just dipsomania. Noun from circa 1844. An uncontrollable, uncontrollable craving for alcoholic liquors. Or liqueurs, if you want to spell it and say it that way and be all fancy-like. I have never heard of this word. Dipsomaniac is a noun. Dipsomaniacal is an adjective. And this is from the Greek dipsa, which means thirst. And then just the lower Latin mania at the end. You can put mania on the end of anything and it's going to make it sound fun, maybe, possibly. Maybe not. 
let's see. So, um, what? I've never heard of this specific term being used for someone who has an uncontrollable craving for alcoholic liquors. Is this a medical name for this? Is this a like a disease? Or would you just call an alcoholic a uh, dipsomania? Um, and then uh, the dipso, one affected with dipsomania, ha- they are a dipso. Hmm. This this is kind of a new word for me. Okay, the next word. Oh, my throat did a weird thing. Dipstick. Noun from 1927. One. A graduated rod for indicating depth as of oil in a crankcase. So, a uh, rod for indicating depth. It just You fill up the thing with the oil. You want to see how much oil you, ha- oil you have. Oil you have. And um, you stick the dipstick in the thing, and it's got lines uh, that say how many maybe millimeters or centimeters or inches or something, or maybe just num- random numbers. One, four, seventeen, eighty-two. I have 82 oil. Uh, And then you stick it in the thing and you pull it out carefully and you see where the oil went up to and you read off the number so you sound like you know what you're doing and then you make sure you have a towel there so you wipe it off and then you put the dipstick back in the thing. I have probably done this two times in my life. Possibly more. I genuinely, I don't, I don't, maybe, yeah, a couple of times, that might be it. I guess, should I do it more? Should I check my dipstick in my car more? Okay, uh, number two for dipstick. The synonym is nitwit. Dipstick nitwit. And it is a euphemism for dipshit. They're very, it's if you, if you want to be nicer, if you don't want to swear, instead of saying dipshit, you can say dipstick. Because it almost sounds like you're going to say it. But it should have been something with an S-H shout sound. A dip shirt. Dip shit, dip shirt. Those are a lot more close than dipstick. Dipstick is still pretty good. What did we just watch? We watched something where somebody was trying to not swear, kind of. And instead of saying, oh, I can't remember. I'm ruining this. I'll think of it later, maybe. Number three for dipstick, a chemically sensitive strip of paper used to identify one or more constituents of urine by immersion. And the example of these constituents are glucose and protein. So uh, it's it's checking your urine for a thing. I imagine this kind of maybe being like... um, what was it, that the acid or base test when you stick a thing in a liquid and the color it changes is going to be tell you whether it's acid or base and how much along that spectrum. So maybe this is a similar thing, but it's checking your pee-pee and uh, it's, they call it a dipstick. It should be called a pee stick? Nah. The next word. <laughs> Dipterin. Adjective from circa 1842 of relating to or being a fly. Are you being a fly? Let's go be a fly. Um, and it, then it says sense to a. Now, is that is that must be the two a definition for the word fly? It doesn't really say that, but that must be what it is. It's the little buzzy fly. Dipteron or dipterin is a noun, and dipteris is an adjective. So dipteris today being like a fly. This is from the Greek dipteros, which means two-winged or two-winged. From di plus pteron, which means wing. Double wings, the two wings. Couldn't they be called Diplaterons? Diplaterons? There's more of the word feather. Double wings. So I believe they have actually... So you'd think that a pair of wings would be a double wing, uh, but or two-winged, but I think they actually have two sets. That's why it's the two-winged. They got you know one closer to the head and one closer to the butt, I guess. They're probably pretty close together. I don't know. I haven't really looked at a fly that close, but I, I think... I mean, I have but 
I think they might have a double set of wings, and that's why they're called dipterans. All right, there is one more word for this episode. Hey, wouldn't it be terrible, terrible if I looked over at this recorder and it wasn't recording? That would have been probably the longest I've ever gone. To re-record a whole thing? I did the sound effect. The word is dipterocarp. D-I-P-T-E-R-O-C-A-R-P. Dipterocarp. Noun from circa 1876. Any of a family of tall, hardwooded, hardwood, tropical trees, chiefly of southeastern Asia, that have a two-winged fruit, a two-winged fruit, and are the source of valuable timber, aromatic oils, and resins, especially a tree of the type genus. Of, it's a tree of the type genus, and then it says the, the genus, but it's in parentheses, which is Dipterocarpus. That makes sense. Um, and then the family name is Dipterocarpaceae. Dipterocarpaceae. Uh, they're trees. Tropical trees, chiefly in southeastern Asia. But I don't understand what this two-winged fruit thing is. What, what fruit has wings? Yeah, the dipterocarp fruit. It's from dipteros, and then also carpos, which is just the suffix carpus with a C, and I don't know what dipteros means, but it's probably double, it must be double-winged, but I don't know what carpus, yeah, so it's double-winged fruit tree thing. All right, all right, radio. What what were the words in this episode? We had diplopod, diplotine, dipnet, dipnewin, dipody, dipole, dipole moment, dipper, dippy, dipshit, dipso, dipsomania, dipstick, dipterin, dipterocarp. Okay, let's see. What have we got here? The dipnet was just, just a fun word, fun little scoopy fish thing. I did not understand the electricity stuff. Dipper's a good one. I'm leaning to either dip shit or dip stick. And I feel like it's a little on the nose if I pick dip shit. So dip stick seems better. Also, I think it's kind of funnier to call somebody a dip stick than a dip shit. It's like, it's just say dip shit. No, I'm making a choice to say dip stick just because I don't know why. Isn't it funnier? It's funnier if you say dipstick. First, it's just funnier. I don't know what you think, and I don't care. No, I do. So, dipstick is the word of the episode. Dipstick, 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 dipstick. I think it's easier when you just sing the word instead of trying to come up with other words, which I just did. Dipstick, 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 dipstick. That was the end of that. Thank you very much for listening. If you have, why have you? This has been Spencer Dispensing Information, sort of, kind of. Bye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the podcast called The Dictionary. I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Hey, 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 hey. Now we can hear ourselves in all the ways that we need to. Okay, um... Hey, first of all, thank you for turning on this podcast for some reason, and uh, I hope you enjoy whatever it is going to be, because it's going to be something. The first word in this episode is diptych, D-I-P-T-Y-C-H. It's a lot of consonants. Noun from 1622, one, a two-leaved hinged tablet folding together to protect writing on its waxed surfaces. So there is... Uh, nope, nope, nope. That's the picture for number two. We're on number one. You can't jump ahead. Uh, it's a hinge tablet folding together to protect writings on its waxed surfaces. Um, so I'm trying to visualize this exactly. And uh, this is why we need to put a link on the social media or a picture of this diptych so we can see 
what it looks like, and then we can figure out what it is. Hinged tablet. Yes, you put your writings in there, I guess. And it's, it's very fancy. It has a waxed surface. Number two, a picture or series of pictures painted or carved on two hinged tablets. They are attached to each other on a hinge, so you can you can move it around. And I think you sit this on the floor. Um, let's see. The uh, it says it says an example is an altar piece. So maybe you put it in your altar to close off your altar. Not so sure. There is a picture of this diptych. Yeah, it looks like these are tall things, I would think. Maybe it's short. There's no scale. It doesn't tell me. Is it three inches, four inches, or is it eight, six feet, five feet? I don't know, but it's two panels. They look pretty identical. They're extremely ornate. Black and white drawing, of course. There's no color here. There's a circle in the middle uh, with a, looks like a person on the inside, uh, kind of like the thing on the, on the bills, the one, the five, the 10, the 20, with some sort of special human being inside of a circle in the middle. It does kind of look like a, like a fancy dollar bill, but on its side. And uh, yeah, it just has a bunch of those like fleur de flower fleurs. That's what you call them, ornamental things, designs. Okay, number three for diptych, a work made up of two matching parts. I think of a painting, two paintings in their own frames, and they're a diptych. Although, is that a, I mean, if there's three, it's like a tri, it's not a tridic, a tritic, trip, triptych. That's what the three is called, triptych. So the diptych is two, but they're not, I don't know if they're usually matching or if they are two, um, two things in a set, in a series that go together in some way. Uh, so yeah, I would think of the latter more, but maybe not. Maybe they match sometimes. They probably do. I feel like there's going to be something different, though. Isn't that the point? Oh, but now we're talking about art. What is art? Let's move on to the next word. Uh, we need to make a sound effect. Uh, what is it going to be? We're going to say... The next word is diquat. D-I-Q-U-A-T. Noun from 1960. A powerful herbicide and plant desiccant, C12, H12, Br2, N2, used especially to control aquatic weeds and to desiccate aerial plant parts before harvesting and the example of those aerial plant parts would be potatoes so it's an herbicide plant desiccant i we read desiccant and i don't remember this is the problem i don't remember shit so i have to keep on looking back i'm using the dictionary as a dictionary while i'm recording a podcast about the dictionary uh, what, what, what were the desiccant, D-E-S-I, it's this one, it's a, it's just a drying agent, okay, it's, it would be so good if I had a perfect photographic memory of every single page that I've read, uh, I'm, my photographic memory isn't that good, so, plant, it's a thing to dry out plants, powerful herbicide, this podcast is just me learning stuff, and for some reason I want to say it out loud, and for some reason, you're listening to it out loud. Um, control aquatic weeds. Yeah, even even the sea gets weeds. I guess you got somebody's got to go pull up the weeds in the in the sea. Uh, and it's also used to dry out aerial plant parts like potatoes. I didn't know p- potatoes were plant parts, or maybe a part of the potato. How many times can we make the p p p sounds? But you got to do it before harvesting. That's what it says. It's a diquat. Um, it's just from di plus quaternary. The fancy way to say something that's like four quaternary. Okay. I don't remember what the sound effect was. It was something like, ooh. <laughs> It'd be great if I really had less of a memory of it every single time. But usually after the second one, I, 
I got it. The next word is dir, D-I-R, abbreviation for one, direction, or two, director. Yep, maybe someday, this would be fun, someday my name at the end will say D-I-R, period. That would be wonderful. The next word, deram. Deram, noun from 1991. It says to see the word somoni at the money table. So we will jump to that at some point. Talk about somoni at the money table, which I guess is also called deram. Why does it have two names? Uh, this is a Tajik word from the Persian dirham, which means coin or money from an Arabic word. It doesn't even say what it is. And there's more at the word Durham, D-I-R-H-A-M, which we haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> Durdom. Durdom. Deer, deerdom? Deerdom and Durdom, I think. That's how you'd say it. Noun from circa 1693. It is Scottish. That makes sense. And the synonym is the word blame, and there's no example, and I would really love it if they put an example here. So, uh, let's see. It's blame, durdom. It, it's from the northern dialect Scottish durdom with a U, or durdan. Uh, that means uproar. It is of Celtic origin, akin to the Welsh durd? D-W-R-D-D, durd, and that means noise. That's exactly what that word is, just noise. D-W-R-D-D, whoa, well, what? Welsh, Welsh is a fun language, uh, at least to me. It, it, this word durd also means clamor. From the Middle Irish dorden, which means humming or droning. But the word is blame? Like we're blaming? some? I'm not even going to look it up. Okay, dirdum, Scottish for blame. The next word. Oh. Dire. Yeah, it's like a dire wolf. D-I-R-E. Adjective from 1565. 1A. Exciting horror. As in dire suffering. Yes, it is so exciting when I am suffering. Exciting horror? Dire suffering? 1B, the synonyms are dismal and oppressive, as in dire days. Dire days, they're so oppressive. I feel like every single episode of this podcast really should have a guest on it. That seems like what would make the most sense, right? Help me to do that, because I think that's what this deserves. Number two, warning of disaster is a dire, as in a dire forecast. It's an adjective that's describing the forecast as, as a warning of disaster. The forecast can just be the warning of the disaster. Dire is just something else. Okay, number three A, desperately urgent, as in uh, dire need. I am in dire need. It is very urgent that I need this thing right now. I'm desperate, please. Thank you. Three B, the synonym is extreme, as in dire poverty. All of these, I think, have a very negative connotation to them. Um, a dire forecast. Maybe there's some crazy fucking weather coming in, and you, uh, and, and it, that's very dire because maybe it's a big storm where it's very unsafe. So that's dire. That's sad. That's depressing. Somebody, people might die. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then dire need, it's very urgent. Oh, if I don't get it, something bad is going to happen. Happen. And then dire poverty is very, very bad p- 
poverty, which is worse than n- normal poverty. So that's bad. It's, it's uh, yeah. And then dismal and oppressive. Yeah. You don't want things to be described as dire. Not typically. Direly is an adverb and direness is a noun. And the dire wolf, I guess, is uh, it's just very scary. That's pretty much it. You are in a dire situation if their wolf is there. That's the goddamn name of that thing. This is from the Greek dinos, which means terrifying, from the Sanskrit dvesti, which means he hates. Oh, I hate it so much. All of these dire things. Okay, the next. The first form of the word direct or direct, direct. You sound different if you say these different ways. Direct or I'm going to direct you. Um, It is a verb from the 14th century. And we're going to take a quick sip of water, which was just edited out. This is, uh, we're starting with transitive verb for direct. 1A is obsolete. To write to a person. And the example of what you are writing is a letter. To write a letter to a person is to direct. Yeah, obsolete, you got that right. 1B, to mark with the name and address of the intended recipient. To mark with the name and address of the intended recipient. That's to direct. You're directing the package go to a specific person. 1C is to impart orally. To tell you a thing with the words and the mouth, if you can, and that is direct. 1D, to adapt in expression, so as to have particular applicability. To adapt in expression, so to have particular applicability. I feel like I'm thinking so hard on the words, not listening to the meaning. Adapting... Uh, As in the example, arguments directed at the emotions. Ooh, they had a very target. They were worded in such a way that they really struck at those chords that we have as humans with emotions. Ooh, arguments direct, directed at the emotions. Uh, Yeah, that's particular uh, applicability. 2A, to regulate the activities or course of. You are directing the car to go a different way in this one. 2B, to carry out the organizing, energizing, and supervising of. To carry out the organizing, energizing, and supervising of. As in, direct a project. You are making sure that all of those things happen. Organizing, energizing the troops and supervising them, telling them what to do. 2C. To dominate and determine the course of. Dominate and determine. So if you are so, you're so dominating in your this situation uh, that you control how the thing goes. Uh, I mean, we can think about that very esoterically, spiritually, uh, metaphysically kind of, we can think about it that way, or we can think about something more literal, uh, dominate, the, determine the course of, whatever some physical situation is. There's something bigger, it's going to control the way thing goes, or more dominant in some way. 2D, to train and lead performances of. By the way, I didn't really finish my thought about to dominate and determine the course of, I don't know, y- if you if you think a lot about spirituality stuff, you can't not think of like yes, this is uh, whatever's going to dominate this situation. Uh, that's going to determine the course of your life. That's how I think of things sometimes. Um, determinate the course. Yeah, it's a very dominating thing. It's going to yeah take control of your life. Just other ways to think about it. Number two, uh, two D to train and lead performances of as in. 
direct a movie. Direct a movie. You are telling me to direct a movie? Okay, I shall. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, that would be a really fun thing to do. I've wanted to do that my whole life, so maybe we'll do that. It, that's, that's the goal, right? One of them, to train and lead performances of. You are training them? Training them to do what? In a, if you direct a movie, you're training them to be what you want them to be. Uh, and then, yes, you are leading the performances either as one of the actors or telling them how to perform, sort of, kind of, the way that you want them to perform. That's basically what a director does. The, the book said it. Number three, to cause, to turn, move, or point undeviatingly, or to follow a straight course. To cause, to turn, move, or point undeviatingly, following a straight course, you're direct. You're, you're not swerving off to one way or the other way. You're just staying the course. That's what we're doing with our lives. Directing straight ahead. But, you know, maybe it's fun to go this way, or maybe it's fun to go that way. You know, you got you to gotta do what's right for you. Take direct your life the way that you want it to go that's what spencer says um there is an example x-rays directed through the body Ooh, i got the x-rays going through my body Ooh, that's so fun x-rays going through my body oh yeah i think that's it number four to point, extend, or project in a specified line or course, as in direct the nozzle down. Point it that way, not at my face. I don't want the water sprayed in my face. Five. To request or enjoin with authority, as in the judge directed the jury to acquit. Hey, you jury, can you do some acquitting, please? Number six, you got some authority in that situation. Number six, to show or point out the way for. As in, the judge directed, no, uh, signs directing us to the entrance. They are directing us towards that thing. We want to go to the entrance. No, we don't want to go to the exit. We're not ready for that. Go to the entrance first before you go to the exit. That's how life works. To show or point the way for. Let's point the way to number, number intransitive, number one. To point out, prescribe, or determine a course or procedure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And number two, to act as director. That is what that's what you do when you are directing a movie. You are acting as director. I, hey, it's me. I'm acting as director. That's a clumsy way to say that. A synonym, two of them. Two, command and conduct. Commanding people to do what you want when you are directing something and conducting them in a certain way. Like a music conductor, you are composing everything to your whim. Hmm... Uh, this is from the Latin directus, which means straight, from derigere, which means to direct, and there's more at the word dress. Dress? You gotta dress the part. So the words were diptych, diquat, dir, diram, dirdum, dire, and direct. Well, I think diptych and diquat win for the best sounding words. But of course, I have to pick direct as the word of the episode because, you know, I related to all the things in here. I want to direct a movie. How, well, how can you say anything other than that? So uh, we, we, we can do uh, direct a movie. Let's go do a directing of a movie. Direct. That's, that was the end of the song. You didn't need to go more than that. Thank you for listening very much and uh until next time this has been spencer dispensing information goodbye hello word nerds welcome to another episode of the dictionary it is the podcast hosted by me spencer parks uh okay let's see go ahead and follow this uh this podcast this show this whatever this thing is go follow it subscribe to it whatever the nomenclature is the verbiage on whatever podcast platform you prefer 
Uh, is it Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google? I don't even know all the... Uh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, what else? Go ahead and share it. Share this podcast with everybody you know. Rate and review because the algorithms love that data. And if you want to follow this show on Instagram and Twitter, it is at DictionaryPod. And I am at SpeedJampar, Instagram, Twitter, all the places, even TikTok where I put some dictionary videos up there. There's also a Facebook page, The Dictionary, if you prefer Facebook. If you want to email me, contact me in any way, all of those places are great. Also, the email is dictionarypod at gmail.com. If you want to talk to me with your voice, you can call the Google Voice number and leave a voicemail. 917-727-5757. If you want to make your own very short theme song for this show, 15 seconds maybe or less, uh, and if it's, you know, good and appropriate, I'll put it in an episode. You can email me the audio file. That would be great and wonderful, and I would thank you oh so much. Uh, Let's see. Patreon. Uh, It might be under Speed Jampar. The link is in the show notes. Patreon for this show. You can get early episodes and exclusives. And merchandise, if you want the merchandise, go to the Tee Public link in the show notes. Uh, yeah, I think that is all the information that I probably need to say. Okay, the first word in this episode is the second form of the word direct. Adjective from the 15th century. One, having or being motion in the general planetary direction from west to east. And then also just not retrograde is direct. So the planetary direction is going from west to east, and it's going direct. It doesn't go backwards. It doesn't change. And uh, that's, that's just direct. 2A, stemming immediately from a source. And this, uh, the, the example is direct result. It came from the source, the thing that created the result. It wasn't an indirect result, which means that it would go to a source and then another thing, and then you get that result from that second thing. You always want to get it direct. Factory direct to you. To be. Being or passing in a straight line of descent from parent to to offspring and the synonym is lineal lineal line direct that makes sense as in direct ancestor so your direct ancestor would be if you go uh, to your dad and then to their dad and then to their dad or you know dad to mom to mom to dad whatever it is there it's direct through the line of lineage straight down to you or straight to them There's no, like, by marriage or siblings or anything like that. Uh, And I don't know what exactly we're talking about. Being or passing in a straight line of descent from parent to offspring. Uh, So we're talking about genes, maybe. Maybe uh, maybe somebody's redhead, and they pass that gene direct down from them to their offspring and then to their offspring, etc., etc., etc. 3A. Is that where we are? No. We are on 2C, having no compromising or impairing element, as in a direct insult. There's there's nothing in between. There's nothing compromising this insult or impairing it in any way. It's just it's it's the full insult from the direct source from the beginning straight on to the person who is who it is insulting. 3A. Proceeding from one point to another in time or space without deviation or interruption. The synonym is straight, as in a direct line. Yeah, a lot of these, they're very similar. It's just from one thing to another, the shortest distance between two points. There's no, what did it say here? There's no deviation or interruption. It's not stopping. It's not going off in another direction. From there to there, done. 3b proceeding by the shortest way as in the direct route you might have to go at an angle to get the shortest route what's that phrase do they say as the crow flies 
It's 30 miles away as the crow flies. So if the it doesn't have to be a crow, just anything that is flying in the air and is not uh, limited to roads or sidewalks or something. It's a straight shot from one place to the other. If you could fly over the trees and the buildings, you could go the 30 miles. But if you are if you have to go on the roads or the sidewalks, then maybe it's like 40 miles. That's a big difference. Number four, the synonyms are natural and straightforward, as in a direct manner. I like it when things are described to me in a direct manner. Be very short and to the point. Doesn't necessarily have to be short, but specific and in a logical order of things. Now, I don't always describe things this way, but I prefer it uh, if they are described to me this way. Very straightforward. Not a lot of back and forth and, oh, uh, well, wait, I got to say this thing before I say this thing, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, that's not helpful. Number 5A, marked by absence of an intervening agency, it, instrumentality, or influence, as in making direct observations of nature. Uh, and to, so there's nothing in the way of making these ob- observations of nature. You're right out there in the nature. You're looking at the trees and the plants and the birds and the bull weevils and the monkeys and all those things right there. Um, the instrumentality, I was a little confused by that. But in this case, uh, for this example, if you had like a camera in front of you, that would be considered an instrument and then it would not be a direct observation. You got to take away the instruments. Use use your ears, your eyes, your nose, your fingers, your touching things, maybe your tasting things. Those are all direct observations. 5B effected by the action of the people or the electorate and not by representatives, as in direct democracy. So it's not a lot of a lot of voting election systems in at least America are you vote uh, for a thing and then there are people at the top who then place their vote theoretically based on how the people voted but not necessarily and uh, so but in this case direct democracy is where your vote does actually count and you're not sending your vote to somebody else to vote on your behalf. Five C consisting of or reproducing the exact words of a speaker or writer, as in a direct quotation. If you are quoting somebody, you have to do a direct quotation. You have to make it clear that you are quoting them. you got to source your things whenever you can, which is all the time. If you are not going to directly quote them, then it's a paraphrase, and you should say, this is a paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing. There's probably some other name, too. An indirect quotation? Would that be a thing? I'm not so sure. Number six. Characterized by close logical... Characterized by close logical, causal, or consequential relationship, as in direct evidence. They use this in the trials. Uh, Logical, causal, or consequential... Yeah, I, I don't know if I can describe it any better than that, but I think... Somebody else could probably direct evidence. This is evidence that was taken directly from maybe a witness who saw the thing or from the scene of the crime and, uh, you know, indirect evidence or was they say circumstantial evidence is uh, it's not direct. It's not firsthand information. You don't have proof of it. And number seven, capable of dying without the aid of a mordant or mordant and dying is spelled d-y-e-i-n-g so this is uh, probably about dyeing something a different color or something like that and i don't know what a mordant is but for to do direct dying you don't need a mordant you're dying directly onto the thing whatever that means okay We have to make a sound effect now, which is the end of one word and the beginning of the next word. And we're going to go... 
the third form of direct. Adverb from the 14th century. So there's just one definition with a few sub-definitions. It is in a direct way. Direct adverb is in a direct way. As a from point to point without deviation or also by the shortest way as in flew direct to Miami. If it's not direct, you you probably got a layover somewhere and that's no fun. It is cheaper. You can get cheaper flights if you do layovers, but then you know, then you run the risk of missing the flight if one of them's delayed or your bag's not making it. It also just takes longer. So no, you, you, you got you to gotta think about all those things. Direct. From point to point without deviation. You're not deviating in any way. Uh, once, I'm trying to remember, I think we were trying to get to Florida for some family thing and either the plane was overbooked or maybe we had a layover in the middle and then we missed the flight, whatever it was, uh, they had to put us on a different flight. And I just remember them saying, so we had we had to go to another city before we go to the Florida. And they said, you're going to go to D.C. And I was like, I don't know, probably eight, eight or 10 years old. And I was like, isn't that in the wrong direction? And I just could not get over the fact that like we're flying in the wrong direction to eventually go where we're going. That was not direct at all. Uh, Okay, B for the adverb direct. From the source without interruption or diversion, as in the writer must take his material direct from life. And that is a quote from Douglas Stewart. If you are... So what Douglas is saying is that the writer has to has to write from their own life. You don't have to. I mean, I don't know what context Douglas was talking about. Mr. Stewart, what were you saying? Uh, But, you know, writers often do take things from their life, from their interests, from the stuff that they are more knowledgeable about. So, uh, you know, if you want to write something, then I think you should uh, write something from your life, something what you know. That's what they say, write what you know. So do that. C. Without... An intervening agency or step, as in, buy direct from the manufacturer, and it will come factory direct to you. Straight from the manufacturer, nobody in the middle to upcharge the price. Okay, what was the sound effect that I did? I don't remember. (laughs) Okay. Direct action is next. Two words, noun from 1912. Action that seeks to achieve an end directly and by the most immediately effective means. And the examples of these are boycott or strike. So though boycotts and strikes are direct action because they are very specifically and directly Uh, working to stop a thing, to get people to not buy a thing or to get people to get paid more. Action that seeks to achieve an end directly and by the most immediate effective means. Yeah, people going on strike. I think right now in in England or Europe, there's a whole bunch of strikes going on. Uh, What is this? December 2022. And, oh my God. No, I don't want you to listen to me. Stop talking watch her phone so what 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 was i saying the people going on strike that is the most effective way to get the employers to to pay them more money because they don't have any workers and they need the workers to work otherwise they're not going to get their thing done it's direct i totally forgot what that first sound effect was that's the problem with doing something off the top of your head you just forget it Okay, the next word is three words, direct broadcast satellite. Noun from 1975, a television broadcasting system. I don't know why I went British. I was trying to do something fun and it came out that way. I didn't like it. A television broadcasting system in which satellite transmissions are received by a dish antenna at the viewing location as a home. That's the viewing location, is the home. 
It is called also satellite and satellite television. They send it directly to the satellite. The dish is there, and it's got the thing sticking out, and the signal bounces off the 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 uh what the saucer thing, and then it then it bounces from there onto the the receiver thing, and then it goes inside. We just watched a movie where some people were trying to install a satellite dish on the roof, and then all hell broke loose. It was the quite silly strange movie for Christmases. The next word. Direct current. Two words. Noun from 1849. Um, I guess the opposite of this is AC, which is alternating current, which I have no idea what I said about that because I don't know much about the electricity, but I just know that they're... One of them's alternating and one of them's direct. So direct current is a noun from 1849, which I said all that. It is an electric current flowing in one direction only and substantially constant in value. And it is abbreviated to DC. It only goes one direction, substantially constant. So it's just constant. It's just constantly going. I honestly don't remember which one we use which one became the winner i think dc is used in some contexts and ac is used in other contexts and then of course ac dc is used sometimes for very loud singing that's direct current (laughs) direct deposit is next noun from 1974 they had the ability to do this boy back in 1974 a method of payment in which money is transferred to the payee's account without the use of checks or cash. You don't need to give somebody a check or cash. They just put the money straight into your account, your checking account, your savings account, whatever you got. Somehow they figured out how to do this before you really computers were a thing. I don't, I don't know. I guess you had to give them your account information and then they could just put it straight in there. That must have been how it was done. Hmm. Uh, yeah, a lot of people who have jobs do this. It's a very convenient thing. You don't have to wait to get your money. You don't have to deal with cash, worry about somebody robbing you on your way to the bank to deposit it. It's very, uh, very good, and I have been using this for a very long time. I don't think there's any issues with it. If they offer this to you, you might as well take it, right? I don't know. The next word. <laughs> directed or directed adjective from 1891 one subject to supervision or regulation as in a directed reading program for students so it must be supervised or potentially will be supervised or regulated in some way which probably means that they're going to give you specific things to read in a specific order, and that's the program that you have to follow in this reading, this directed reading program for students. Number two, having a positive or negative sense, as in directed line segment. Uh, I think this might be math. Positive or negative sense, it's going to go in the positive way or the negative way. A line segment, possibly geometry. Directedness is a noun. The next word. Direct examination. Two words. Noun from circa 1859. The first examination of a witness by the party calling the witness. The first examination of a witness. This is the very first time the witness is up there and the first people to, to, to ask them questions. And it is by the party calling the witness. So if the defense is calling the witness, then they are the ones who are examining the witness, which is a weird way to say that. They're not examining them. They're just asking them questions. The first one is called the direct examination. But what we hear more often is it says compare to cross-examination. And so this would be the next set of questioning from the other side, the side that did not call the witness up to the stand. 
That's the one that I hear more in movies and TV shows. I don't ever hear them say, okay, it's time for the direct examination. No, they're like, hey, people, would you like to cross-examine this person? And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be great, dude. Let's uh, let's cross-examine them. I got some questions for you. The next word. <laughs> Direction. Noun from the 15th century. One Guidance or supervision of action or conduct. The synonym is management. The management is going to tell you what to do, and they're going to give you some direction, what to do. Hey, I would like some direction. Tell me what to do. Otherwise, if I'm not told what to do, I'm going to start a podcast where I read the dictionary. Number two is archaic, and the synonym is superscription. Not superstition, superscription. No clue what that is. Somehow it used to be related to the word direction. 3A, an explicit instruction, and the synonym is order. I love explicit instructions. If I'm told what to do, I've already said this before, I think, if I'm being told what to do, I want it to be very explicit. Give me all the details so I know exactly what I'm doing. Do this and then do that and do put the thing over there and do this and cook it at this and whatever it is. Explicit is the best way for somebody like me who is very slightly on the autism spectrum. 3B. Assistance in pointing out the proper route. Assistance in pointing out the proper route. Used usually in plural directions, <laughs> as in asked for directions to the beach. They're going to, the, yes, this, yes, we all know directions. You find directions, you get directions, you ask for directions, you give directions. If somebody has stopped you on the street and they're like, where's the store I got to go to? You're like, okay, first you go down this street, back the way you came. You, you're, you're way out of the way. Turn around, go that way to the light, and then turn right, and then go on. And this is where you got to give explicit instructions. You can't you can't be given directions that are like, you know, go about five minutes and then turn left on the ne that street there. You know, you can't you can't do that. You got to give specific street names. You got to give blocks or mileage. If I'm driving and somebody's giving me directions, the navigator, I want distances, street names. I want this all ahead of the t ahead of time. Any sort of visuals, landmarks that you can tell me about when you hit this thing, you're then you turn left. None of this. Oh, if I guess it's helpful if you've hit this thing, you've gone too far. Okay, I guess that's useful to know. But you're like, but then I gotta backtrack anyway. Explicit, very clear directions are the best. I remember as a kid, my parents pulling out the atlas the paper atlas of the united states map or the state map draw out the route that they want to take before a trip and uh luckily i never really had to do that but i did once i started you know needing to drive myself we had map quest and you would print the directions and that was fun and now we just have it all on our phone and i love it and i rely on it i probably rely on it too much i will admit that but it is very useful and helpful Ah, oh, directions. Okay, that's that one. Um, number four. The line or course on which something is moving or is aimed to move or along which something is pointing or facing. That felt long and clumsy. And there's no example. The line or course on which something is moving or is aimed to move or along which something is pointing or facing. You put a you you put a little toy car facing in this direction. See, it's right there. You you point it in that direction and you hit go. It's gonna go in that direction. That's the direction. Unless something moves it, it's gonna go in that direction. Five is also archaic. The synonym is the number one definition for the word directorate, which uh, is that gonna be in tomorrow's episode. Let's see, direct, yeah, it's going to be in tomorrow's episode. Um, we will also have, 
director in that, and I really wanted to get a guest on. Again, as usual, I just don't really have the time or the energy to try as hard as I should to get guests on. It would have been great to have an actual movie director, but that's okay. I'll have to talk about it myself. Number 6A, a channel or direct course of thought or action. The direction, channel or direct course of thought or, or action. Okay, that's interesting. 6B, the synonyms are tendency and trend. Where are the trends? The people buying things. Are they buying more? Are they buying less? Uh, where are the trends of the climate? What direction is the temperature going? I'll tell you, it's going up. The overall average Earth temperature is trending upward. The direction is going up. And we have to stop it and send it back down in the other direction. 6C. A guiding, governing, or motivating purpose. What's is that like your life direction? The thing that guides your life where you're going, that governs what you do, what, what are you motivated 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 by what is your yeah so um I, I guess my life is going the direction of the dictionary it's the dictionary direction 7a the art and technique of directing an orchestra band or a show as for stage or screen uh, i actually did this i don't remember if i've mentioned this before when i was a senior in high school we had a student run show and uh, the orchestra was part of that, of a small, maybe f 10, 15, 20 person orchestra. And when I was a senior, I was lucky enough to be picked to do that because I, 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 I auditioned. It wasn't really an audition. I filled out an application. And uh, yeah, I, so I was a, um, a, um, an orchestra director. I gave the direction to the orchestra. They watched me. They followed my little baton going in all directions. That was fun. 7B, a word, phrase, or sign indicating the appropriate tempo, mood, or intensity of a passage or movement in music. So, yeah, mostly I think we'd see this in music, but also, you know, in like plays, they're going to give a little extra direction, stage direction of it's gonna it's just gonna describe how somebody moves where do they go what do they do in music it's play it this way play it that way we've come across so many of these i mean one of the most recent ones was you know decrescendo or what was it Dim diminu diminu diminution dim diminutive uh, dimi diminuendo there it is uh so yeah play it quieter gradually quieter Play it loud. Play it, play it plunky. Have they ever used plunky? Think they should. Directionless is an adjective. None of us want to be directionless. I think we all want to have some sort of direction. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I don't know. Directionlessness is a noun. The next word. <laughs> Directional or just directional if you get rid of one uh, syllable adjective from 1842 number one of relating to or indicating direction in space in space what's a direction in space north south east west well we have 1a that was number one here's 1a suitable for detecting the direction from which radio signals come or for sending out radio signals in one direction only, as in a directional antenna. This antenna is very specifically created to go out in one direction or receive from one direction. And if you got to send or receive into another direction, maybe you got to move it over a little bit. I don't know how far, but yes, receiving, sending radio signals, directional. 1B, operating most effectively in a particular direction, as in a directional microphone. I think the one that I'm using is fairly directional. I don't remember the exact sort of uh, pickup pattern. Uh, but yeah, there are, 
there are microphones that are going to pick up kind of like a big blobby area in front, or there's some that are, that are going to pick up like a very skinny directional area. Uh, so we we use we use directional mics at work, and I tell people I'll say don't move much from this microphone because. Uh, it's pointed right at your mouth, and if you move a little too far away, it's not going to pick up your mouth very well. So you got to have it. So like if I go over here, you can't really hear me so well because it's kind of directional. And then I get it closer, closer, and then I go the other way, and oh, my God, you can't really hear me so well anymore. Directional microphone. Let's get all up in the directional microphone. And we can go further away. You can kind of hear me, but when you get further away, you don't hear me so good. So let's get up nice and close. Number two. Relating to direction or guidance, especially of thought or effort. Directionality is a noun. And we have one more word for this episode. <laughs> direction angle. Two words. Angle. I need this reminder, as I'm sure many of you do. Angle is spelled A-N-G-L-E. Noun. From 1882, an angle made by a given line with an axis of reference. So there's a line, and then there's another line that's in relation to the first one, and then the angle that those two lines create is the direction angle, an angle made by a given line with an axis of reference. So you always need that base axis for reference of where did you start from, and then where, because if you just have one line, there's no angle, you need at least two. Specifically, such an angle made by a straight line with the three axes of a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. And this is used usually in plural, direction angles. Okay, I think it is time to reread the words. Uh, because after this, I gotta go home because we got a storm coming through. This is the, the crazy cold wintry storm that we're talking about right before Christmas in the Chicago area. It's probably not going to be as bad as they say, but I've been outside already and it is quite cold. So today we had direct, direct, direct action, direct broadcast satellite, direct current, direct deposit, directed, direct examination, direction, directional, and direction angle. Hmm. Well, I think I picked direct as the word of the episode in the last one because I really liked all the stuff that was there and I really related to a lot of it. Um, what are we going to pick this time? Direct deposit is good. It's You get your money fast. Uh, let's see, direct current is, uh, you know, it's electricity is good. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of thinking about direction. I don't know. Directional, direction, angle. I don't know. None of these are really jumping out at me let's pick direct current as the word of the episode because if it weren't for direct current we would not i would not be able to probably plug in this recorder thing and make this thing happen and of course you all want this podcast to be happening and so thank you direct current for making this podcast happen thank you direct current for making this podcast happen you're giving me the electricity that is the end of this episode thank you very much for listening and until next time this is spencer dispensing information goodbye hello word nerds welcome to the dictionary this is the podcast where I am reading the dictionary, and then I talk about it, and I sing, sing songs and make jokes and explain things and to tell stories, and I don't know, which is whatever the hell comes into my brain is just what pops out. So uh, if you like me, or if you want to know more about me, or enjoy the, the craziness that comes out of my brain, and then through my mouth, then you might enjoy this podcast. Okay, uh, let's see, I thought maybe I had something to say. Oh, you know, like I said in the last episode, it would have been great to have a guest on this episode. You know, if if I were more well-known, if people actually knew about this podcast and it was uh, a big hit across the charts, 
uh, then maybe it would be easy to have gotten an actual movie director or some sort of director for this episode. But alas, that is not the case. There has not been enough people filling the algorithms with all the wonderful data and giving it the five stars in their ratings and the reviewings. And also all the sharing. Uh, so yeah, you just have to deal with me talking about it. Maybe someday, maybe someday... I don't know what letter it'll happen in, the E's, the F's, the whatever's, it'll be easy to find excellent, perfect guests for at least some episodes, eventually all episodes. The, I'm doing everything I can. You gotta help me. The first word in this episode, the top of page 354, it is direction cosine. Two words, direction, and then cosine is C-O-S-I-N-E. And we had the word cosine back in the seas. Noun from circa 1889. Any of the cosines of the three angles between a directed line in space and the positive direction of the axes of a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. And it is usually used in plural, just like the last word in the previous episode, which was direction angle, uh, which was very similar to this one, but it's about the cosine, the, any of the cosines of the three, so it's not the angle necessarily, it's the cosine of the three angles between a directed line in space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, 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 my brain doesn't know fully what to do with all this information. Uh, okay, well, we have to do a sound effect, and I think just because we will have the word director in this episode, I feel like I gotta do something director, directorally, directorally, um, what do we say, action? Uh, sure, we'll start with that, and then we'll think, see if we think of anything else. Action! Direction finder is next. Two words, noun from 1913. A radio receiving device for determining the direction of incoming radio waves that typically consists of a coil antenna rotating freely on a vertical axis. So it's gonna find where the inf where the radio waves are coming from. A radio receiving device for determining the direction. Of yeah, it determines the direction of where the radio waves are coming from. It's, uh, it moves freely on a vertical axis. I can visualize this in my head. I don't know if I've ever seen one. Hmm. Maybe we'll put a link in the show notes and post a picture on the social media. Direction finder. Hmm. That's interesting. It's crazy that somebody invented how this thing and it exists. Action. Directive is next. First form, adjective from the 15th century, one, serving or intended to guide, govern, or influence. Number two, serving to point direction, specifically the 1B definition for the word directional, which was, I think, in the previous episode. Directional, yep. Uh, serving to point direction. It points the things. It's a directive. Three, of or relating to psychotherapy or counseling in which the counselor introduces information, content, or attitudes not previously expressed by the client. So they're directing the conversation towards things that have not been brought up. Uh, that's what I'm guessing. Psychotherapy, counseling, which... The counselor talks, they bring up uh, topics. Action. Second form of directive. Noun from 1902. Something that serves to direct, guide, and usually impel toward an action or goal, especially an authoritative instrument used by a high-level body or official. Uh, I immediately think of what, like, with Star Trek, they've got the prime directive, but any sort of thing where there's somebody in charge and they're telling somebody else what to do, they're giving them a directive. It's a, a, they're directing them, it's a guide, and it's, uh, it's to, to do a thing, an action or a goal, to get a goal done. And action. 
Directivity or directivity is next. Noun from 1928, the property of being directional. Directivity. Action. Direct lighting. Two words, noun from 1928. Lighting, in which the greater part of the light goes directly from the source to the area lit. So if you want your subject lit, you point the light right at them. The majority of the light is going from the source, which is the bulb or the bulbs or the LEDs or something, and it goes straight to the thing that you want lit. But if it were like indirect lighting or something, then it would be maybe, you know, when you put a light on a thing, it, it creates a cone. The, the most bright part is in the center, and then it sort of gradually gets a little more dim. And so if you want it to be lit by just the dim part, then you're going to angle the light over a little bit. Or maybe you want the light to bounce off a thing, um, and then it's going to be, and then it bounces off maybe like a white wall onto your subject. That's not going to be direct because you're not pointing it at the subject. Action. Directly is next. Uh, Let's see. So directly or directly This is the first form, and it does say that in sense two, it is often pronounced directly, no T sound, directly or directly. We're taking out a syllable there. Directly or directly. It's a very weird way to say that word. This is an adverb from the 15th century, number 1A, in a direct manner as in directly relevant, also as in the road runs directly east and west. Straight to the east and straight to the west, not off by a little bit, it's only in those directions. 1b, in immediate physical contact, directly, you, you you gotta be touching a thing, physical contact, from one thing to another thing that is directly. 1C, in the manner of direct variation. I can't really give you much more about these. I should also say that uh, I'm going to probably have a lot to say about the word director. So, kind of saving a lot for that. 2A, this is the one that is pronounced directly or directly. Without delay, the synonym is Immediately, immediately, as in, the second game followed directly after the first. No delay, right away, let's do it. It's a double header. I hope the team has gotten well rested because they got to they gotta play another game directly after this one. Directly. Directly? Do we not say the T sound in this context? Maybe a lot of people don't. Directly. Directly? I don't know. To be, in a little while, the synonym is shortly, as in, we'll be leaving directly. Just a little while, not too long, just just give me a couple of minutes, just shortly, we'll be leaving. Ready, set, go. Action. Second form of directly, or directly, or direct, directly. The first emphasis syllable one less syllable word, directly. It's a conjunction from 1795. It is chiefly British. Immediately after, that is the definition. And the synonym is as soon as. As soon as that thing is done, we are going to directly do another thing. There is an example. Directly, I received it. I rang up the shipping company. I feel like I said that weird, in addition to my terrible British accent. Directly, I received it. I ran up the shipping company, which is a quote from F.W. Crofts. Immediately, as soon as I received it. What did I receive? I don't remember. I rang up the shipping company. I called him up as soon as I received it, because there was a problem with the package. Action. Directly, proportional is next. Adjective from 1796, related by direct variation. Are we going to see direct variation? 
Oh, I'm looking ahead. It's got a ways to go because we got to go. There it is. In the next episode, we will have direct variation. Okay, so directly proportional is related by direct variation. And it says compare to inversely proportional, which is probably the opposite of directly proportional, which is, I don't know, is it related to direct variation? Or it's probably related to inverse variation or something like that. And action! The next is direct mail. Two words. Mail is M-A-I-L. Noun from circa 1923. Printed matter as circulars. Prepared for soliciting business or contributions and mailed directly to individuals. And we, I believe, now call this junk mail. The, the, uh, the advert it's a lot of advertisements they print up things they get circulated around they send them directly to these to the people in the neighborhood maybe and uh, they don't want it and they toss it and it's a waste of paper and stuff and I don't know maybe maybe they get a little bit of business from these things but I don't know they're just sending it direct to you because you love it next action direct marketing Two words, noun from 1961, marketing by means of direct communication with consumers. And this is through catalogs and telemarketing. So you got, uh, you're directly communicating with the consumers. Uh, But a catalog is not really direct. I mean, telemarketing is, you're calling them up directly there. I guess if you're ordering from a catalog, you you might call them up directly, but uh, yeah, direct marketing straight to the consumer opposed to, I guess this would be not direct marketing, opposed to going to a store. The, the business is selling to a store and then the people are buying from the store. That's not direct. Yeah. Action. Directness is next. Noun from 1598. One, the character of being accurate in course or aim. You have to be very accurate. If not, you do not have directness. Number two, strict pertinence. And the synonym is straightforwardness, as in, her directness was disarming. And that is a quote from Robin Cook. Some people don't like it when people are direct with them. But I think it is good to be direct with somebody. Say, tell them how you feel, what you're thinking, uh, especially if maybe you got an issue with uh, what they said, how they said it. Uh, Yeah, it's good to be direct with people, to have directness. Strict pertinence, though. I feel like if you don't know what directness is and you read strict pertinence, you are probably going to have to look up at least one of those words in the dictionary to learn what that is. Uh, I feel like that's more complicated. I don't know. Maybe that was the easiest, simplest way for them to write the definition, but I don't know. It seems seems like it could have been a little better. Next. Action. Direct object. Two words. Noun from 1879. A word or phrase denoting the goal or the result of the action of a verb. I know I've heard this used but basically, I mean, it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, so let's see. I pick up some apples. I guess the direct object would be the apples, right? It's the word of the phrase denoting the goal or the result of the action of the verb. I pick up is the verb. Pick up. I am one of the objects, I think. And then I pick up a thing. That's the verb. That's the action. And then what am I picking up? The result of the action of the verb is the apples. Why are apples the first thing that we think of when we're trying to give examples? Is A is for apple. We've learned that it's like the first word uh, in the thing. The doctor, eat an apple a day, keeps the doctor away. It's like the most, I don't know, there's just something about apple. I can't be the only one who thinks this. It's just like, it's the thing. It's the first letter, the first word. I don't know, something, something. Next. Action! This is a fun word. It is directoire, directoire, or 
directoire, you can emphasize the second syllable or the third syllable. I feel like emphasizing the third syllable is the best way. Directoire. Capital D-I-R-E-C-T-O-I-R-E. Adjective. Oh, real quick. I don't think there has been any etymology for a while. I'm just going to do a quick scan back to see if there's anything that I missed, but I don't think so. Okay. Directoire. Adjective from 1864 of, relating to, or imitative of the style of clothing, furniture, or decoration prevalent in France during the period of the directory. I don't know what the directory is. I've never heard of this before. So, this one does have etymology. It is French, if you could not tell. I hope that was clear. Uh, directoire. It is the group the, the word directoire is the group of five officials who governed France from 1795 to 1799, which is just from the word directeur, which is director. So they directed what was going on. Um, hmm. I guess the period of directory was those years, 1795 to 1799. And, uh, and then it's a very short period of time. So anything that is directoire is relating to or imitating the style of that period of time, like the clothing, the furniture, the decoration. Okay, we got to put a link in the show notes for directoire and directory and maybe uh, post to... Now, but it's interesting that this is from 1864, but the this time period was 1795 to 1799. The, what is happening there? Maybe we need to post on the social media, uh, at DictionaryPod, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, maybe some examples of the clothing, the furniture, the decoration that was prevalent in France during that period. Okay, the next word, action. This is the word director. We'll read the definitions, and then I might chat about it, or maybe I'll chat about it later. Noun from the 15th century, it's just one who directs as A, the head of an organized group or administrative unit as a bureau or school. The head of this group or administration, administrative thing like a school is the director, the head person. B, one of a group of persons entrusted with the overall direction of a corporate enterprise. They are controlling. I don't feel like you usually hear that. Like, maybe if it's like a regional thing, they might be the director of the regional thing. But usually I feel like it's vice president or president or CEO or something. I don't know. I For some reason, I don't know my corporate stuff so well. But for some reason, I feel like director isn't as common as those other ones. C. A person who supervises the production of a show as for stage or screen, usually with responsibility for action, lighting, music, and rehearsals. That's the one that we think of often. It could be a stage show. It could be a movie show, a TV show, a... There's so many shows. A podcast show, an internet show, a... trying to think of other shows... A dance show, which is also a stage show, usually. A music show, often on stage. And D, it is the C definition for the word conductor. Uh, That's probably like the music, the orchestra conductor. Symphony conductor, band conductor. Directorship is a noun. And uh, let's see. Well, I mean, I can mostly talk about uh, the C definition somebody who's running the show, the show for stage and screen. Uh, I mean, my whole life, I've wanted to be a movie director. I was almost sort of going to major in that when I went to college. I sort of went another route, but it was still all sort of the same thing. Uh, but I I feel like it is still in my future. I am old, and I have I've gone a path, but I feel like it, it's 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 not out of the realm of possibilities. The way my life is going, I feel like it still it still could happen. Um, 
and I think a big part of why I didn't do it was just because I didn't, uh, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I could, I didn't feel like I was, once I fully realized kind of what was involved with it, I was like, oh, maybe that's not for me. Maybe that's not where I'm at at my life right now. But, you know, 30 years later, maybe, maybe it will be. Uh, let's do one more word and then maybe we'll talk more about the director in general. Because what does the movie director do? The last word, action, action. I said action. Directorate, D-I-R-E-C-T-O-R-A-T-E. Noun from 1837, one. The office of director is the directorate. 2A, a board of directors... Uh, and that could be in a corporation. They there's a they got a whole bunch of people who need to make the decisions for the corporation. One no two B, membership on a board of directors is the directorate, and three, an executive staff as of a department. There's a department, but the people at the top of the department are the directorate. They might also be called directors. Okay, so we had today direction cosine, direction finder, directive, directive, directivity, direct lighting, directly, directly, directly proportional, direct mail, direct marketing, directness, direct object, directoire, director, and directorate. Yeah, we're going to pick director as the word of the episode because... I have just always had a very close connection to this word, uh, more so probably as I've gotten older and learned more about what they do. So what do they do? Well, I think people are often more confused about what does a producer do. Um, A director can be a little bit more clear, though, but can also be kind of confusing. I feel like I've heard when when directors say, when they ask, people ask them, what do you do? They usually say, you just got to make a lot of decisions. If especially if it's sort of like a big budget thing, I think they uh, people from all the different departments say, "Do you want red or blue? Do you want this or this? What do you want?" And then the director was like, "Okay, I wanted to look. I like this choice. I like this choice. I like this choice." To all the different departments, hair, makeup, wardrobe, wardrobe, set design, actors, st- actor style, editing, music, sound effects catering man they might not choose the catering but they might all the things everybody they are the one who people come to to say what do you want this to be like but if a director is very involved or is very opinionated and you're going to have all levels throughout the years of movie making and tv show making you're going to have all levels of that but if they're very opinionated and and they know really what they want then they're they're still making choices but it's from their own brain and so they're going to say okay I want it to be like this and you, you got to put this thing in this way and you do this like David Lynch is uh, very he knows what he wants so he takes control of that kind of stuff um but you know there's also directors who are just hired especially back in the olden days they're just hired to be a director and so you know it's already been written they've got they've got all the the crew chosen and so it's the director's vision. They say, okay, well, what? how do you want this to be like? What do you want it to look like? What What style do you want? The writer is, they could, they could put as much information as they want into the script, but it's really up to the director. Uh, they're the ones who just, who, who control the show, who, who decide what, what happens. Um, and often a lot of creative choices, but sometimes... Uh, the heads of the departments, the the directors of the other departments might say, hey, we, we think it should go this way. What do you think? Say, yeah, that's cool. So I hope, I really, really hope that directors give the respect that their crew is due. The crew is due a lot of respect because they do a lot. And I feel like I don't hear that enough from directors, like when they're accepting awards. You know, they might throw it a little bit, but I don't know. I feel like they need to do more. And I don't really listen to a lot of interviews. So maybe they talk about it in, in interviews. But yeah, the the crew, 
is extremely important. It is a family affair to make a movie. Um, it's it's a whole group of people coming together to create a thing. And uh, yeah, so the director, that's the director. And I don't know, back to myself, because that's the, the only thing I know to talk about. Um, I wanted to do this. I've loved movies ever since I was a kid. And I, yeah, I started to go to college, get to college, and I was like, oh, well, I don't know, I don't know if I'm cut out for that part of things. I can do some other things, maybe, uh, but yeah, I don't know if I'm cut out to, you know, run the show. I don't really have, like, a creative vision like some people do, Um, but, you know, as I've learned more about filmmaking through college and then being on the job and doing a lot of things up you know I've learned a lot um it's been a long long process but I feel like oh maybe maybe if I have a script or can somehow put the effort into writing a script maybe maybe I could maybe I could direct a movie I I think I could you just need you, you need the thing you know you need the thing to direct once you if somebody else were to write a script I think I could I could turn that into a thing but then you need the time and the money and that's a whole other ding dang dong ball of wax Um, I think I probably talked about director enough. Um, if you have any thoughts about specific directors you like, what you think that they do, interesting choices, I don't know, you can email me, direct message me, call the Google voice number, um, you know, right off the top of my head. Um, I, I don't follow directors as much as other big movie fans do, but you know, David Lynch, He's, he's a director. You got to check out his stuff. He's got a style. He knows what he wants. He does his thing. He is he uses that creative thing more than most people. Um, I always loved Tim Burton, but, you know, I liked his first half of his career more than his second half, but I feel like with Wednesday, the show Wednesday, which we started to watch, I feel like he's getting a bit more... A bit, a bit back into, you know, more practical effects and stuff. I just personally thought it went a little too much into the CGI realm. Um, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and chat about directors for a while. There's a bunch of good directors, a bunch of good directors that I don't even know about. Um, and I, I will admit, the first directors that I can think of in my brain are male. They are men. Um, I, it's but, but we have been seeing a lot more female directors and uh, non-white directors coming into making movies and telling their stories, which is just a really amazing thing to watch and see. Um, You know, the first one I can think of is, you know, like Ava DuVernay. I think that is the proper way to say her name. Um, Ryan Coogler did Black Panther. Um, Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're seeing a shift in the directors of movies and then the stories that are told because of them. And that is a really, really important thing, I think, for inclusion and for getting the full breadth of storytelling to show to the world. Um, You know, this is just America. You know, you look at other countries where a lot of Americans don't like foreign movies because you have to read or it might be different, but you if you go watch them, you're going to get a whole other viewpoint about the world that you never would get otherwise. I don't even know where I'm going with all this. Director is the word of the episode. I want to be a director. I think I will someday. I just have to make the decisions to make my life go that way. Director, director. Yeah, it's fine. I don't know. Okay, this has been Spencer Dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Ho, ho, ho. I am recording this on Christmas Eve. I am making a TikTok video. You got to go to at Jampar. Somehow my microphone is under my beard. You should definitely go look at this. Um, This is a take two. The first take got all screwed up for multiple reasons. I won't even bore you with it. The first word in this episode, I should talk like Santa Claus. Directorial. D-I-R-E-C. T-O-R-I-A-L. Adjective from 1770. One, serving to direct. And that is going to be it for this TikTok video. Let's post it. Ho, ho, ho. All right. At Speed Jampar.
The first one had no Santa face for some reason. It just wouldn't appear. Maybe it couldn't recognize that there was a face behind this mustache. Um, but it did have some snowflakes, so that was nice. Okay, directorial. Just serving to direct. That's it for number one. Number two, of or relating to a director or to theatrical or motion picture direction. Oh, that uh, that thing that's happening is very directorial. I'm, I'm try, how, what, what context do you use this in? Relating to a director, so just anything that's about a director, somebody who's directing a thing, is directorial. Three, of relating to or administered by a director. Or a directory. A directory is going to be uh, later, yes, later this episode. So when we get there, something related to that is directorial. So I think just uh, sort of tagging on to what we had yesterday with director, we still obviously are talking about the director world. Um, The sound effect will be cut. Cut. Director's chair is next. Two words and director's has an apostrophe. Noun from 1953, a lightweight folding armchair with a back and seat usually of cotton duck cotton duck uh so it's a good thing that it has a seat if the director's chair didn't have a seat then it wouldn't be so much of a chair would it um so it just says it's from its use by motion picture directors on the set they use it and up until now i I was like, why Why is this chair, why is this called a director's chair? What's the purpose of it? Why did they use this type of chair? And I just realized it's foldable, it's lightweight. They're off, directors often have to go from set to set and move around a lot, and they want a place to sit, and they don't want to use a stool, uh, so they, they've got this director's chair. I wonder if it, what it was called before directors started using it. So they would probably have an assistant just grab the chair. It's very easily foldable and it's not heavy. And then they're like, hey, I want to sit over here. Put that chair there. And then they just drop it down and it unfolds. And it's got a seat so they can have something to sit on. And then a back so they can lean up against it if they want. Maybe it even has a little place to put your feet And, uh, yeah, there's tall ones and short ones. And then, you know, at some point, they started getting fancy and they would embroider the person's name or maybe their title or their, you know, actors use this too. They got director's chairs for actors. Then it's an actor's chair. Uh, Yep, I think we have one of these at work. I don't know why we don't really use it as a director's chair, but it's, it's a good thing to have. And the fabric is called Cotton Duck. I don't know what that's called, what the, what it is, or, or why it's called that. Cut. Director's cut is next. Two words. Noun from 1980. That seems late. But I guess it kind of makes sense if you think about the movie world. It is a version of a motion picture that is edited according to the director's wishes. I mean, you'd think that the original one would be... A, edited according to the director's wishes but not usually and that it usually includes scenes cut from the version created for general distribution so there's a lot of reasons why things might get cut down differently than how the director wanted them to be cut um sometimes the producers the production company they get final cut so they're the ones who say we want it cut a certain way different than what the director wanted which just boggles the mind that but it's all about business and money um you know they maybe it's too long they could cut it down because they want to get it under a certain length for some reason um maybe they're trying to get like a pg-13 rating instead of an r rating so they might cut things out from that but then the director's cut which is also sometimes called unrated these days or not rated uh, they'll put those things back in um, but yeah, you know, ever, well, since we started getting uh, DVDs, like the late 90s, early 2000s, they would put in the extra scenes. Either you could just watch the deleted scenes or you could uh, watch the whole thing as the director's cut all together, which was very cool. Uh, and we've, 
it seems like now at this point, they know that they're going to make a director's cut version when they're editing the movie. And so they're like, hey, we got we can we can release two versions and make more money um, if we cut this out and then we can put it back in later. I think Blade Runner is one of the most famous examples of so many different versions of a movie. Uh, Brazil, I think, had multiple versions. There's what the producers wanted and then there's some other version and then the director cut and then maybe multiple versions of the director's cut. Um, of course, Lord of the Rings have extended cut. I think those would be considered the director's cut. They're just called the extended versions. And who, boy, are they extended. That's, uh, let's see, you're listening to this in uh, almost the middle of January. Yeah, 2023. But um, New Year's Day or maybe the day after that, uh, we may have watched all three Lord of the Rings director's cut extended versions which is about 11 and a half hours long and it's so much fun i think that's enough for director's cut cut next word is directory first form adjective from the 15th century serving to direct and the word directorial also had serving to direct but for directory we have a specifically Providing advisory, but not compulsory, guidance. So you can, if you're acting as a directory, you're doing something in a directory way, you are giving them advice, some sort of guidance, but they're not required to take this advice or guidance. It's not compulsory, it's just advisory. Cut! Second form of directory noun from 1543 and i should also mention that of course the uh directorial uh was of relating to or administered by a directory which is this word 1a a book or collection of directions rules or ordinances all of the things that direct people to do things in a certain way is the directory I guess with the the yellow pages, the phone book, is that a phone directory? 1B, an alphabetical, haha, this one, an alphabetical or classified list of names or addresses, or both. Uh, Maybe after this this podcast, I should read the yellow pages, read uh, read the phone book, the phone directory, the directory of all the people in the whole world. That would be a very big book. Two, a body of directors. All the directors are the directory. This is probably more of like a a board of directors, something like that. Number three is the 3B definition for the word folder, which is maybe a place that you can put your, your collection of directions, rules, or ordinances. It's in a directory. Cut, cut. Next is direct primary. Two words, noun from 1900. A primary in which nominations of candidates for office are made by direct vote. And uh, what did we have? We had it, was it in the last episode? Uh, Oh, there was direct something else that was kind of like this. You're voting directly for the person instead of going through some sort of other thing. Hmm, I can't find it. That's okay. That's direct primary. It's the, So it's the primary, it's the first vote, uh, and they get to vote directly for them. Cut. Next is direct product. Two words, noun from circa 1925. The synonym is Cartesian product, but especially a group that is the Cartesian product of two other groups. And I think... Cartesian has to do with math or uh, science-y kind of things. Mostly math, probably. Now, that's probably when things are multiplied together. Product is when you multiply things together. I think, sure, maybe, possibly. Next. Cut, 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 cut. Direct response. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1976. 
of or relating to direct marketing, which was in the last episode, which was marketing by means of direct communication with consumers through catalogs and telemarketing. So direct response is just related to direct marketing. And there is an example, direct response advertising. So it's advertising and then you get a direct response from the person. Maybe, what's what would this be? Like maybe you get to watch them as they see the ad and you get that direct response or maybe after they watch it there's a very direct way that they that they respond either buy a thing or not i don't know i need a little bit more context next word uh these next three words i think are very related uh so the first of these three cut is directress it's the word direct with an R-E-S-S, noun from 1580, and it is a woman who is a director, and 1580, that's very old. This is probably, you know, for, for plays and things. I'm actually shocked that they even let women direct plays in 1580. That's, you know, you know I don't mean that, but, you know, it was such a patriarchal patriarchal system even more so back then that everything i mean even all the actors the men would play the women parts so uh but yes a, a woman who is a director of some kind it doesn't have to be plays it could be other things uh that they, they they decided because this is what they decided a long ago you needed a whole new word for a woman who does a thing actress directress etc etc and this is not a word that I think I've ever heard before so clearly. If a woman is directing something, they're just a director. Next. Cut. Cut. Directress. Now, this one, though, is pronounced directrice because it is spelled D-I-R-E-C-T-R-I-C-E. Directrice. This is a much more fancy way to say it. Noun from 1631, and the synonym is just directress. Fifty years later, they thought that they needed a new word, I guess. And maybe, here's another word like this. Cut. Directrix. So it's the word direct with an R-I-X at the end. So we had directress, directrice, and directrix. Noun from 1622. Ah, this one is right in the middle, kind of. Between directress. So it went directress, then directrix, and then directrice, or directrice. So number one is archaic, and the synonym is directress. This word sounds very silly now. But number two, there's a lot more information here. And... It looks like it's not related to those other words at all. It is a fixed curve with which a generatrix generatrix maintains a given relationship in generating a geomic, geometric figure, specifically a straight line, the distance to which from any point of a conic section is in fixed ratio to the distance from the same point to a focus. It's all about math and geometry, and I would need to sit with it for a while to understand. It's a curve, though. It's a fixed curve um, because it's going in a direction. Let's see. The etymology is not helpful. Uh, it's related to this straight, but it, so it says specifically a straight line. The di but the main definition was a fixed curve. So what is it? Is it a curve or is it a line? A straight line, the distance to which any point of a conic section is in fixed ratio to the distance from the same point to a focus. So something about it's the same distance away. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking of like an oval. It has the two focus points or the, the focus point of a circle is in the center. I don't know if that's somehow related. Directrix. Maybe, maybe we'll post a picture on the social media because for me, I need to see this thing. To understand it. I'm a very visual person, which is why reading words is sometimes not helpful for me. Next. Cut, cut, 
cut. Cut the tape. Cut the film. Direct sum is next. Two words. Noun from circa 1928. And the synonym is Cartesian product, which we saw before. And it says compare to direct product, which is where we saw the synonym Cartesian product. So I guess they're the same. Direct product, direct sum. Although, when I think about sum and product, those are different. A sum is when you add two things together. Two plus two is four. Did I get that right? I think I did. But product is when you multiply them together. Two times two. Oh, wait, it's also four. That, that was a bad example. Three plus three is six. Three times three is nine. But I don't know... If, those, if that's the right way to think about sum and product in this context. Moving on. Cut. Direct tax. Two words. Noun from 1770. A tax exacted directly from the taxpayer. You pay the tax from one, from the taxpayer to the person taking the tax. It's very direct. I don't know an example of an indirect tax. I don't know... What, you pay the tax to somebody and then they pay it to somebody else? I guess maybe maybe if you're buying something at a store, would that be an indirect tax? Because you're paying the tax to the store, but then they got to pay taxes on top of that, maybe? Something like that. Oh, cut. Cut. Direct variation is next. Two words. Noun from circa 1949. One. Mathematical relationship between two variables that can be expressed by an equation in which one variable is equal to a constant times the other. 2. An equation or function expressing direct variation. And it says compare to inverse variation, which is probably the opposite. And I'm not even going to try to explain this. Cut. Direful is next. No more direct words. D-I-R-E-F-U-L. Adjective from 1565. Number one, the synonym is dreadful, as in direful war began again. And that is a quote from Charles Dickens. Maybe it was a tale of two cities. I don't know. Uh, Let's see, dreadful, direful. Well, of course, if we look back at the word dire, I mean, I think most most people probably know what it means, but let's be more specific. Uh, Let's see, okay, yeah, we had horror, dismal, oppressive, extreme, urgent. So, uh, yeah, direful is, yeah, just dreadful. I don't think this word gets used much anymore. It's from the 1560s. That fun time, the 60s of the 15s. Number two, the synonym is ominous. I do think this is a word that we should bring back. It's a little harder to say, though, direful than dreadful. That's easier. Direfully. (laughs) Direfully. We just added an L-Y. That is an adverb. Cut. Second, no. (laughs) The next word, the second word after the first word of direful, which is like the 12th word, dire wolf, two words, noun from 1925. So this thing existed. It is a large extinct wolf-like mammal known from Pleistocene deposits of North America. So in North America, they lived in what is now North America and uh, things were deposited Was it their bones? Was it their poop? It was probably their bones were deposited from the Pleistocene era, whatever uh, time period that was. And uh, their scientific name is Canis dirus. So I wonder if the wolf was evolved from the dire wolf specifically. It says it's wolf-like, so probably. And um, I'm going to assume, because it was all these many years ago, that it's larger than a wolf because most animals were larger back then. And uh, yeah, it probably looks a lot like a wolf. Maybe we'll post a picture of um, what what they think 
the dire wolf looked like. Which is probably just going to look like a wolf. And of course, maybe we'll post a picture of uh, the dire wolf portrayed in uh, Game of Thrones, which were just just very just big wolves you know i think they used actual wolves or something like that and uh they used cgi and forced perspective to make them look even bigger next word cut dirge d-i-r-g-e noun from the 13th century number one a song or hymn of grief or lamentation especially one intended to accompany funeral or memorial rites. And rites there is R-I-T-E-S. I think, well, let's finish reading. Number two, a slow, solemn, or mournful piece of music. So that one is less, so the first one's more about a funeral, maybe a religious situation of grief and sadness because of a, a death probably, but also it's just a piece of music that's just slow and sad. And three, something, like a poem, that has the qualities of a dirge. So maybe they're talking about grief or lamentation. Maybe it's memorializing something or someone. Dirge-like is an adjective. And uh, this is from Middle English, dirge which means the office of the dead? What office is this? Where, what are we talking about? Um, which is from the first word of a, what? The first word of a lower Latin antiphon, which is from Latin, it's the imperative dirigere, which means to direct, and there's more at the word dress. This etymology was extremely confusing, and I think we need to put a link in the show notes from Etim Online for the word dirge. But I do think uh, that maybe we should put in an audio clip of a dirge. Um, you know, I think I think in New Orleans they're very common, but sometimes it's also more f- not necessarily fun music. Yeah, well, I don't know what we'll put in, but um, we'll try and find a good example of a dirge and put it in somewhere, somewhere around here. The next word, cut. Durham or Durham, D-I-R-H-A-M, noun from 1788. Number one, it just sees, it just says, see the money table. Go to the money table. We're going to see so many examples of money that we're going to be told to go see the money table so many times before we actually get there. Number two, it says, see the words dinar and rial in the money table. This is an Arabic word from the Latin drachma, which means drachma, which uh, we won't see that for a little while here in the D's. And our last word, cut. Dirigible or dirigible. D-I-R-I-G-I-B-L-E. I think... I think I like to say dirigible or dirigible. Yeah, maybe the dirigible. This is the first form. It is an adjective from 1581, capable of being steered. Hmm, really? So anything that is capable of being steered is a dirigible. A car, a bike, my emotions. I don't know. Um, so, wait, I'm going back because there's something in the edge of my... Yes. Uh, this is from the Latin derigere, which means to direct. So if anything that can be directed in some way steered, I'm just going to say literally anything. Anything is a dirigible. But we will get to the second form in the next episode, so you got to hold on to that. Dirigible. Hmm. Okay, that was a fun, fun way to end this. All right, so it's uh, rereading the words time because we got to pick up the word of the episode. It's very important. We had directorial, director's chair, director's cut, directory, directory, direct primary, direct product, direct response, directress, directrice, directrix. Now wait, d directrice. Yes, we, emphasis is on the last syllable. Directrix, 
direct sum, direct tax, direct variation, direful, dire wolf, dirge, durham, and dirigible, or dirigible. Dir- that's just a fun word to say. Dirigible, 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 dirigible. Okay, I think, I mean, how can I not pick director's cut as the word of the episode? There are some other fun ones in here, like, you know, direct tax, direct variation, direct sum, direct product, dire wolf. But yeah, director's cut is going to be the word of the episode. Uh, because, you know, we, we want to see. We want to see what they cut out. What were the other scenes? What what did the director, how did the director want this to be done? Um, there are some movies out there that producers took over, but I don't know if they ever got a director's cut. Like, um, David Lynch's Dune is the first one that I can think of. He hates this movie because they just completely took over and they kind of forced him to make something that he didn't want to make, and it's not his vision. Um, It's a very weird movie. I finally saw it earlier this year or last year, and um, I just don't know what his vision would have been like and what, 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 what would David Lynch's Dune be opposed to the Dune that we got? Yeah, I don't know. Director's cut are really fun movie. I don't know where I'm going with this dumb song. All movies should be director's cuts. That's a song from for today. That's a, that's what you get today. All right, uh, we got to end this. I got, I, got, I got stuff to do. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. <laughs> Cut. That was terrible. Bye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Yes, it is. I am Spencer, and I am reading all of this to you. And uh, thank you for joining me. The first word in this episode is the second form of dirigible or dirigible. And I think either one of those pronunciations is fine. Dirigible, dirigible. Um, This one is a noun from 1885, and the synonym is just airship. Somehow, well, okay, so the etymology says, <laughs> I don't understand what this means at all. It's from dirigible or dirigible, and then in parentheses it says balloon. So an airship is kind of like a balloon, but it doesn't say why this word means balloon, where, who is, I, maybe we got to find some etymology and put it in the show notes. It's just lacking a whole lot of information. Um, the only thing that I can tell you is that um, something that can be steered is a dirigible, and so an airship can be steered, but how it went from just anything that can be steered to an airship is, it's a it's kind of a leap. So somewhere this balloon thing came in to play, and I'm not sure how. All right, the sound effect will be... The next word is either dirigism or dirigism 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 d i r i g i s m e noun from 1947 and it is economic planning and control by the state so the state the the government the thing that runs the show uh, they're the ones who are doing this economic and plan- planning and control. Uh, Dirigist, that is an adjective. And yes, this is a French word from diriger, which means to direct. So yes, it's all about directing and controlling and saying what, what's to do, what, what's going on. Dirigism, that seems like the more proper way to say it, opposed to dirigism. The next word is the first form of dirk, D-I-R-K, noun from 1557. It is a long, straight-bladed dagger, a dirk. And this is from the Scottish dirk, spelled D-U-R-K, which I'm going to assume is not in this book because we're sort of, we're just talking about it here. But yeah, I guess this must be a... uh, a Scottish 
a Scottish dagger, and I do believe that we will need to post a picture of this Dirk. Uh, let's just do a quick look at D-U-R-K. No, I'm not seeing it here. A Dirk is a dagger. The next word. Front frown. The second form of Dirk is a transitive verb from 1599. So what is this? 42 years later, and it is to stab with a Dirk. Ah, you dirked me. You, you stabbed me with a very long, straight-bladed dagger. I don't want to be dirked. Don't, don't be dirking nobody. The next word. Front, front. It is dirl or just dirl. D-I-R-L. Intransitive verb from 1513. Uh, and yes, we are in the short little Scottish section. This is a Scottish word, and the synonyms are tremble and quiver. Dirl. I am probably like trembling with fear, I would think. Um, trembling, quivering. It doesn't specifically say why you are trembling or quiver, quivering, uh, but it seems like based on those words, I would think it's more fear-based. Maybe if somebody is pointing a dirk at you, you will dirl because you are afraid that you might get dirked. It says it's perhaps an alternative of thorough with a T-H. Thorough dirl. I love I love, I love learning these Scottish words. I don't know why. They're, they're so much more fun than some other words. Okay, the next word. Front, front. Durndle. D-I-R-N-D-L. Durndle. This seems like it might be a Scottish word. I don't think it is. It is a noun from 1937. One. A dress style with tight bodice short sleeves, low neck, and gathered skirt. You got to gather the skirt up in some way, somehow. Uh, so it's tight, probably around the torso. The leaves are... The leaves? The sleeves. There, It has no leaves. It's not a tree. The sleeves are short. The neck is low. And the skirt is somehow gathered somewhere. Durndle. And number two... A full skirt with a tight waistband. Um, you know, other than the than it being tight kind of around the waist or torso, it doesn't doesn't really say how these are different. I guess the this the first one is the style of all those things, and then the second one is the actual skirt. Let's see, this is from German uh German dialect word Dirndl, which means girl, and then they added Clyde, but where does Clyde, C, uh, K-L-E-I-D, that means dress, but, oh, I see, I skipped a whole part. This is short for Durndle Clyde, which is Durndle, which is girl, plus Clyde, which means dress, so it's a dress for a girl, but then it just got shortened down to Durndle anyway, which is just girl, so the name for this dress and this dress style just means girl, but it's it's a girl dress. Okay. Glad we sorted that out. Uh, maybe we will need to post a picture of this uh, on social media, Instagram and Twitter at DictionaryPod if you care to see what this Durndle dress looks like. Frow, frow. The next word is dirt. D-I-R-T. Noun from the 13th century. 1A. Huh. The synonym is excrement. I genuinely don't know if I've ever heard of excrement b- described as dirt. Huh. Oh, this is so interesting. Okay. Well, we're going to get more into this. 1B. A filthy or soiling substance as of mud, dust, or grime. It's just anything that's gross, dirty, soil. It's going to soil a thing. Hmm. Hmm. I'm just thinking about how these words are used. So we got dirt, and then dirty, and soil, and soiling. Something that's been soiled. Oh, funny words. Uh, just just dirty is mud, dust, grime. Those are examples. 1C is archaic. Something worthless. 
If it ain't worth nothing, you can just call it dirt. Oh, that's dirt because dirt's everywhere, most everywhere. You can get it. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's it's just it's not worth anything. 1D. A contemptible person as in treated me like dirt. Hmm. Contemptible person is dirt. I mean, I guess I always just thought it meant like they treated me like like dirt, like the actual stuff in the ground that because they you walked over it and I don't know. I, the, it's, it's like the example, the definition is made for this specific example. I don't know. I've seen a few things like this in the book. Number two, loose or packed soil or sand, and the synonym is earth. What is earth? Analyze. Analysis. Foreign containment. Substance is a three-phase system composed of various combinations of naturally oh. derived solids. Subject is most commonly referred to as soil, dirt, or earth. Earth? Hmm. It's a fine earth. As in, a mound of dirt. If, if you couldn't tell from the definition or the example, or the, uh, the synonym, I should say, you had to throw in an example. You're giving me examples when I don't need one, and you're not giving me examples when I do need one, like something that's much more esoteric. Okay, uh, there's another example, a dirt road. The, the road is made of dirt. It has not been paved with asphalt or cement. It's just a dirt road, and it's probably got gravel, and it goes... Blah, 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 blah. 3A, an abject or filthy state. The synonym is squalor, as in living in dirt. Possibly literally dirt, just just gross. Everything has been soiled and filthy, and maybe there's excrement around. Hopefully not. Uh, yeah. I, I hope no one. I don't want anyone to live in dirt. 3B, the synonyms are corruption and chicanery, as in vowed to clean up the dirt in the city government. Yeah, the government, sometimes the police force, they have corruption. There are people who have been corrupted because they are greedy and they just want the power and the money, and we can call them dirt. Let's get it, clean it up, sweep it under the rug, but also just get rid of it. Just take it out of the house. 3C, licentiousness of language or theme. And licentiousness is a good word. We'll learn more about that in the L's. Licentiousness of language or theme. And, you know, I think with all these other dirt definitions, I think you could probably sort of figure out generally what that means without jumping all the way to the L's. 3D, scandalous or malicious gossip, as in spreading dirt about his ex-wife. Uh, it's scandalous or malicious. It might not be true. It might be true, but, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't like his ex-wife, and so he's spreading mean, nasty things, and we like to call it dirt. Ooh, do you have the dirt? Ooh, what dirt do you have for me today? Tell me about all the dirt you've got. I like to hear about the dirt. 3E, embarrassing or incriminating information. This is very similar to 3C, as in trying to dig up dirt on her political rivals. Do they have any skeletons in the closet? These are phrases that uh, maybe people who speak other languages might not fully understand. Every language has their own sort of, what do they call them, idioms or adages or something that if you take literally... They don't really make any sense, so you sort of need to understand the context and the language. I'm pretty sure other languages have similar phrases, but they might not use dirt in this context. Maybe they say something else. So, yeah, you know, the skeletons in the closet. What? Do they literally have skeletons? No, it's just metaphorical skeletons. It's things that they've tried to hide, and uh, they don't want people knowing about them. Okay, the etymology... Huh. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting. 
uh, because this is from the Middle English drit. I think that's interesting because they just flipped the R and the I. Drit became dirt. But drit is from Old Norse, and it is akin to the Old English driton, and it means to defecate. So this that's where this word is from. That's why the number 1A, the synonym was excrement. It, it came from to defecate. So it's not, it, it didn't come from this stuff in the ground that we think of. It's just, it's, it really came from dirty. Probably it just came from dirty, which is going to be the last word in this episode. J- dirty, gross, poopy, nasty, blah, 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 blah. Dirt. Um, and I think soil. You know, when we think of dirt, we think of the the uh, the, the stuff that the grass grows from, or the trees, the plants. Uh, but soil is a much better word for that, because dirt obviously gives connotations of dirty, and that's not necessarily what dirt is. All right, we talked about that way too much. The next word, dirt bag. One word. Noun from circa 1967, it is slang for a dirty, unkempt, or contemptible person. Uh, Well, dirty and unkempt have one meaning, like literally a dirt bag. They're gross. They haven't showered, maybe. Um, But contemptible, that's that's a whole other thing. You can be a dirt bag because you can be mean and nasty, and uh, were there any other, you could be corrupt, those types of things. So either, either one of those, you could you could also just be a very dirty, nasty person, and then you'd be a double dirt bag. The next word. <laughs> dirt bike. Two words, noun from 1970. A usually lightweight motorcycle designed for operation on unpaved surfaces. I would love to hear a 10 or 12 year old kid say, oh, I really want a dirt bike for Christmas because it's designed for operation on unpaved surfaces. If you tell Santa that, then maybe he'll get you a dirt bike. I, uh, well, it says it's a motorcycle, so I guess it's often a, a, a motorized bike but I'm pretty sure people call non-motorized dirt bikes dirt bikes. You know, you, it's you know they got those heavy-duty tires with the thick treads, and uh, yeah, I w- I think I probably had a dirt bike, but I was not a a kid who was super interested in the the bikes, not nearly as much as a lot of people I knew. Dirt bike. I just want a dirt bike. The next word. Wow, wow. Dirt cheap two words adjective or adverb from 1819 and it it's it's just exce- i can't talk today it's early exceedingly cheap it's so cheap uh where was that one was something worthless uh we had that in the word for the for the word dirt uh was there anything else that was just really really cheap yeah because it's so it's uh, the dirt, the soil is so abundant overall, you can get it for cheap. So dirt cheap, yeah, you get it. I think I'm chatting too much. The next word, <laughs> dirt farmer, two words, noun from 1920, a farmer who earns a living by farming the land, especially without the help of hired hands or tenants. Hmm. I still don't totally understand why they're called a dirt farmer. They're not farming dirt. They're still probably farming vegetables and things that grow. Uh, But specifically, they don't use help from other people. So it seems like it might almost be a a slang or disparaging thing to call somebody. Ah, you're such a dirt farmer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have quite enough context to make a, an, an opinion about this. Next word, maybe the dirt farmer is dirt poor because they can't afford to hire people. Dirt poor is two words with a hyphen 
adjective from 1937, and it is suffering extreme poverty. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world who are dirt poor. It's just a fact, uh, and I guess, you know, the reason we call them dirt poor is because they can't even afford to buy dirt, or maybe they are literally covered in dirt in the soil. Hopefully not their excrement, but very likely that can be the case in certain circumstances. And, you know, uh, let's just say that there are a lot of extremely rich people in the world who have decided to spend their money on things that um, might be helpful in some way, but overall, oh, you know, maybe they could uh, get rid of world hunger or get rid of a lot of world hunger, uh, g give people some money so they c cannot be so much in extreme poverty. <sighs> Rich people, can you make some better decisions with your money? Okay, the next word is the last word, which is the first form of the word dirty, and we are going to read all the definitions and things, but the synonym information will be saved for the next episode. It's going to give you a little cliffhanger. So, dirty, adjective from the 14th century, 1A, not clean or pure, as in dirty clothes. Make sure you do your laundry regularly. Make sure your clothes don't get too dirty. Don't be rolling around in excrement. If you do, that's on you. Wash them, please, in your own machine, not a machine that you share with other people. 1B. Likely to be foul or defile with dirt, as in... Dirty Jobs, which is the name of a TV show where a guy went and did dirty jobs. Literally, dirty. He would get very dirty. Likely to be foul or defiled with dirt. So, uh, yeah, dirty job is when you are very likely to be defiled or be fouled. Those are fun words to say together. Uh, with just dirt, something that's dirty. Not necessarily dirt, but something that's going to... You know, examples are... Uh, mud, dust, grime, stuff like that. Possibly even the poops. Um, okay, so now we are on 1C, which is contaminated with infecting organisms, as in dirty wounds. If you get a wound, you got to clean it right away. You don't want it to get dirty because it might be infected or contaminated with infecting organisms and that's not gonna help anything you could get very sick inside uh it could get infected that's what an infecting organism is it's gonna it's gonna get infected and we don't want that 1d containing impurities as in dirty coal um i don't know how they make coal i guess they probably take it out of the ground and that's when it has the uh, impurities and it's dirty. But then do they have to refine it in some way so you can use it? Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that. 2A, morally unclean or corrupt. Yes, this is where we had the example of the dirty, the dirty people in government. You got to get rid of them. Morally unclean or corrupt. They're probably actually very clean people. But in their mind, in their brain... They are dirty. We don't like these people. We have ex uh, more sub-definitions for 2A, like 2A1. The synonyms are indecent and vulgar, as in dirty jokes, also as in a dirty movie. And this is very subjective. We've definitely seen this many times. Uh, some people might call... A dirty joke, a dirty movie, something that maybe talks about uh, sex or swear words or something like that. And some people might say they are indecent or vulgar. That's up to your own opinion. Maybe a lot of movies that are unrated. We just watched the uh, Office Christmas Party unrated, and many people would call that a dirty movie. There is lots of swearing and lots of sex things going around. You know, it's up to your opinion. 
I don't know if it, morally unclean or corrupt. See, that's the thing. That's the that's the part that's subjective in that context. Two a two, the synonyms are dishonorable and base, as in a dirty trick. Oh, that was so mean. You dishonored me with that mean trick. Two a three, synonym just one. It is unsportsmanlike, as in dirty players. Maybe they're cheating. Maybe when they lost, they got very peeved off. Unsportsmanlike. You got you got to have some good sportsmanship if you're playing a game. You got to respect the other team. You win or you lose. Don't be dirty. Here's to be acquired by disreputable or illegal means. You got something illegally, not the proper way. The synonym is ill-gotten, as in dirty money. Um, this, this money is morally unclean or corrupt. You, not, you didn't get it the proper way. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You went and you stole it. We see a lot of movies where people get dirty money, or at least they try to get. Sometimes they get it. To see, disagreeable, distasteful, or objectionable, but usually necessary. Hmm, usually necessary, but also disagreeable, distasteful, or objectionable. Uh, and the examples of this are in achieving a desired result, as in hired a thug to do their dirty work. It, there was a movie called Dirty Work, and I honestly don't know if I ever saw it. I think I need to see that movie. It's not the work that you necessarily want to do. You got to do it, I guess. It's objectionable, distasteful, or disagreeable in some way, which is why you might want to hire a thug to do it for you. Uh, yeah, the, the, the killing of the people, the, the, um, the torturing of the people, you know, this is what you think of when you have a movie brain. What do the thugs do? They take care of the people that the other person doesn't want to do. 3A. The synonyms are abominable and hateful, as in war is a dirty business. It's hateful. It's abominable. Nobody wants to do it. It's, it's a tough, tough, dirty business. 3B. Highly regrettable, as in a dirty shame. We regret the thing. We feel very shameful about it. We feel so dirty. 3C. Likely to cause disgrace or scandal, as in dirty little secrets. You don't want your dirty little secrets out because you might have a scandal. 4. Synonyms are foggy and stormy, as in dirty weather. Eh, I don't know. I've never described weather as being dirty unless uh, everything has gotten dirt or soil thrown on it. Foggy and stormy is dirty weather. Hmm. Number 5A is talking about a color, and it is not clear or bright, and the synonym is dullish. As in, dirty blonde. Just just more dull. Not smart. Darker. Not bright. Uh, there was a time where I called myself a dirty blonde because uh, I had very blonde hair when I was a kid, and then it got darker as I aged. Uh, but then now I'm like, no, it's just brown. It's not even dirty blonde. It's just brown hair. B- dirty blonde is just, it's just a, a darkish blonde. It's still called blonde but darker 5b characterized by a husky rasping or raw tonal quality as in dirty trumpet sounds maybe if i find a dirty trumpet sound i'll put an example in here Can your voice be dirty? Let's see. 
characterized by a husky, rasping, or raw tonal quality. 6. Conveying ill-natured resentment, as in, gave him a dirty look. Who? I think we all know what a dirty look is. Don't give me that dirty look. Please don't convey ill-natured resentment towards me with your eyeballs. Dirtily is an adverb, just done in a dirty way of any of these 87 definitions. Dirtiness is a noun. Uh, Let's see. So there is no etymology, but of course you can look back to the word dirt. That's the etymology. Um, And, you know, it means to defecate. So anything that's just been defecated and soiled is dirty. And uh, yeah, as I said, the synonym, there's more synonym information. One, two, three, four, five words we're going to be talking about. And they, it's a huge chunk of text there. That's for tomorrow. I can't wait. Uh, okay, it's time to reread the words. We had dirigible, dirigism, dirk, dirk, dural, dirndl, dirt, dirt bag, dirt bike, dirt cheap, dirt farmer, dirt poor, and dirty. Oh, let's see. I mean, you know, there were obviously some really good words here. Dirty and dirt. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on there. A lot of meanings behind those words. Um, I feel, I feel like I'm gonna pick dirt poor as the word of the episode because I don't want people to be dirt poor. I don't want people to be dirt poor. The rich people can help the people to not be dirt poor. Please, governments, give the people just a base amount of money so they don't have to be dirt poor. Dirt poor. Don't be dirt poor. People people can only do what they can do. And sometimes uh, life, life deals them a bad hand. And so we got to help them out if we can. All right. That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Now, this was kind of a weird one, I thought. My brain isn't uh, isn't working. Maybe it was a problem with the words. Let's blame the words and not myself. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is Spencer, and I would request that you write a review for this podcast. Rate it, review it on uh, Apple Podcasts and all the other places. Share it with the people that you know. Subscribe to it so you get the automatic downloads and things. If you want to contact me, you can email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. You can find me and this show on Twitter and Instagram, which is at dictionarypod. You can tag me in things and send me a message or just follow the posts and like them and comment on them. Uh, My personal is at speedjampar. There's uh, the Instagram and the Twitter and the TikTok, which is mostly dictionary videos right now. If you want to buy merchandise, there's a T public link in the show notes. If you want to call me, that's another way to get in contact. You can leave a voicemail on the Google Voice number, 917-727-5757. It's all in the show notes. Um, Patreon, if you, uh, if you have any dollars that are burning a hole in your wallet every month, you can give them to me and you can get early episodes and exclusives. And when there's a guest, there's sometimes a video component, which I will put up there if they give me permission. Uh, let's see. I think, I think that's fine. That's enough for today. Let's start this episode with the synonym information for the first form of the word dirty 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 filthy foul nasty and squalid a wonderful group of words they all mean conspicuously unclean or impure dirty so conspicuously is like they are very clearly unclean or impure it's not inconspicuous Dirty emphasizes the presence of dirt more than an emotional reaction to it, as in a dirty, littered street. So there's no 
emotion tied to this word. It's just literally dirty. Filthy carries a strong suggestion of offensiveness and typically of gradually accumulated dirt that begrimes and besmears, as in a stained greasy floor utterly filthy. Ugh. This is this is not the fun stuff. It's just layers and layers of dirty, grossy, grossy stuff. Grossy and greasy. Foul. <laughs> We're getting worse, I think. Foul implies extreme offensiveness and an accumulation of what is rotten or stinking, as in a foul-smelling open sewer. Ew, poo gas. That's, I, yeah, foul, gross, 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 gross. Um, okay, and the next word is nasty, and that applies to what is actually foul or is repugnant to one expecting freshness, cleanliness, or sweetness, as in, it's a nasty job to clean up after a sick cat. <laughs> yes, they don't even need to be sick for you to have to clean up after them. They'll drop their their hairballs or throw up or something, and you got to clean it up, and it's a nasty job, but somebody's got to do it, and that's the cat owners. Uh, okay, so there's, there's more for nasty. In practice, nasty is often weakened to the point of being no more than a synonym of unpleasant or disagreeable, as in, had a nasty fall, also as in, his answer gave her a nasty shock. She was, her shock was disagreeable and unpleasant. I have had many nasty falls on my rollerblades when I was a young lad. My knees got all scraped up. Squalid, this is the next of the synonyms. Actually, it's the last one. Squalid adds to the idea of dirtiness and filth that of slovenly neglect. Uh, it adds to the idea of dirtiness and filth that of slovenly neglect. So it adds slovenly neglect to the idea of dirtiness and filth, as in squalid slums. In addition to being dirty and gross, uh, they have also have been neglected. Nobody's keeping them up. All these terms... This is now, it's not usage specifically, but just more information. All these terms are also applicable to moral uncleanness or baseness or obscenity. Dirty then stresses meanness or despicableness. So this is like another layer of the synonym information. Uh, so dirty stresses meanness or despicableness as in, don't ask me to do your dirty work. I have done enough of it myself. While filthy and foul describe disgusting obscenity or loathsome behavior, as in filthy street language. Oh, so filthy. Uh, as also as in, this is the example for foul, a foul story of lust and greed. And then nasty implies a Peculiar, a pe peculiarly offensive unpleasantness, as in a stand-up comedian known for nasty humor. Distinctively, squalid implies sordidness as well as baseness and dirtiness, as in engaged in a series of squalid affairs. Well, that was a whole lot of fun synonym information. Lots and lots more than usual. We got we had additional things and a whole other level because that second section started with all these terms are also applicable to moral uncleanness and baseness or obscenity. So not the literal being dirty or nasty or gross or stinky or whatever. Uh, this is more about the, uh, the the yeah the moral the emotional the the opinionated ways of being dirty, filthy, foul, nasty, or squalid. All right, let's get to the rest of the words. Um, and the sound effect, ooh, I thought of one. Oh, we're just going to do ew. 
because we're talking about things that are dirty. The second form of dirty is an adverb from circa 1931. It is in a dirty manner. As A, the synonyms are deceptively and underhandedly. As in, fight dirty. It's kind of like cheating. You're being it's you're doing it in a dirty manner. If somehow maybe if you're uh, you're boxing, you're putting some extra weights in your in your mittens. B. The synonym is indecently. Indecently, as in talk dirty. But some people who are talking dirty, they don't think it's indecent. That's not the right. This is a very subjective synonym here. We see that a lot. Ew. The third form of dirty verb from 1591, starting with transitive number one. To make dirty. Dirty it up with the dirty things. 2A, to stain with dishonor, and the synonym is sully. You have sullied your honor when you dirtied it. 2B, to debase by distorting, distorting the real nature of. You are debasing a thing because you are distorting the nature of it. And then intransitive is just to become soiled. Oh no! I've dirtied my pants. The next word, ew. Dirty bomb, two words, noun from 1956. A bomb designed to release radioactive material. That is very dirty. There, I feel like dirty, dirty, dirty. Yes, um, it, it's releasing radioactivity. So is the dirty specifically to the radioactive or is it the way that it releases it? You know, if you're going to release radioactive material, it's just going to flow th- through the air on the on the wind, and it's going to get in a whole lot of other places that it's not supposed to be in. I mean, it's really not supposed to be anywhere. But it's a dirty bomb. I guess just any bomb that's radioactive, has radioactive stuff in it, is just a dirty bomb. Why is it 1956? They they had the those big radioactive bombs in the in the forties, but I guess they didn't call it a dirty bomb until the fifties. Ew. Dirty laundry is next. Two words, noun from nineteen sixty seven. Private matters whose public exposure brings distress and embarrassment. Called also dirty linen. Maybe that's maybe that's how the Brits say it. Dirty linen. Sounds a lot more proper to me. Uh, you you don't want your dirty laundry out in the open. You know that's why they call it dirty laundry. You don't want people to see your your dirty, soiled, filthy, foul, nasty, squalid underwear. You want to keep that private, and then you can wash it. But uh, yeah, your dirty laundry, it's not it's not the physical clothes that you wear. It's the things that you've done that you don't want people to know about. Next, Ew. dirty old man. For some reason, dirty old man is in this book. Noun from 1932. I wonder how long it's been in the dictionary. A lecherous old man, older man. I I think that definition actually makes it harder to understand. Lecherous is a much more it's a harder word for people to understand, uh, especially younger people. People don't say lecherous very often. They say dirty. Uh, so, you know, you have to wait until the L's to learn about what lecherous means. It's not good. It's not good. There are many dirty old men out there. And what do you, what do you say about that? I just think it's funny that it's in the book. The next word. Ew. Dirty pool. Dirty pool? Two words. Noun from 1918. Underhanded or unsportsmanlike conduct is dirty pool. I need some more context. Are we playing water polo in the pool and they're not being sportsmanlike, so it's a dirty pool? 
what what is the context? We might need to put some more information in the show notes for this one. The next word. Ew. Dirty rice. Two words. Noun from 1954. This might be one of the few places where putting dirty in front of a thing makes it better. There's another one that's not in here, which is like a dirty chai, a cafe drink. If you put the word dirty in front of it, it means you add espresso. So any any drink, anything that doesn't have coffee, espresso, you put dirty in it and it becomes a dirty thing. A dirty chai is the most common. I get those fairly often. For some reason, that's not in here. Maybe they added it in a more recent version. That's another place where adding dirty makes a thing better. Like dirty rice, a Cajun dish of white rice cooked with chopped or ground giblets. I don't know what makes it dirty. Is it the ground giblets that makes it dirty, or is it the Cajun seasoning that makes it dirty, or is it both? Next. Ew. Dirty tricks. Two words, noun from 1963. Underhanded stratagems for obtaining secret information about or sabotaging sh- sabotaging an enemy or for discrediting an opponent, as in politics. Dirty trickster is a noun. So maybe the dirty tricks are airing their dirty laundry to the world that they don't want to see. Uh, or their their skeletons. Their skeletons in the closet would be their dirty laundry, and they have used dirty tricks to release them. Secret information about. Next. Ew. Dirty word. Two words. Noun from circa 1774. Hello, dirty word nerds. So this is a word, expression, or idea that is disagreeable or unpopular in a particular frame of reference. I think that was a very good objective way to describe that. Based on other definitions we've seen, it can get, it feels subjective. But no, I think this was good. In a certain frame of reference, they may, these words or phrases may be disagreeable to some or unpopular. What are some examples? I think you can think of a lot of examples Maybe we will put a list in the show notes of examples of dirty words. There's a lot, and we come up to them every once in a while in this podcast, and we are going to come up with a whole lot more of them. There are lots of dirty words, and some people love, they love the dirty words. The next word, that was the last of the D-I-R words, um... And I'm noticing the book did a weird thing here. There's the spacing got a little bit messed up. Um, hmm, I wonder why or how that happened. That's interesting. Okay, so, ew, ew. The next word is the first form of dis, D-I-S. And uh, you could also spell it with two S's if you want. Dis or dis. It is a verb from 1980, transitive verb specifically. Number one is slang. In fact, number two is slang also. They might as well just say the whole thing is slang. Number one, to treat with disrespect or contempt. And the synonym is insult. Ooh, did you just diss me? Number two, slang. To find fault with. And the synonym is criticize. So this is short for disrespect. So if you are disrespecting somebody in some way, you are dissing them. Treating with disrespect or contempt, finding fault with. um, Yes, if you are criticizing somebody, not not constructive criticism, just, just general criticism, that's disrespectful. You have dissed them. Don't be dissing people. Be nice. Do a nice, not a diss. The next word. Ew. The second form of diss, also with two S's. Noun from 1986. So the previous one, the first form is the verb. This is the noun 
uh, six years later, number one, but the, it's all slang. It's all slang. Number one, a disparaging remark or act. And the synonym is insult, as in, was meant as a tribute, not a diss. That's from Vibe. Vibe. Maybe that's when uh, this was used in 1986. I don't know. But the thing that is said in a disrespectful or contemptible or criticizing way is a diss. I'm sure many people have lots of disses for me in this podcast. Number two, slang. The synonym is just disrespect. All the disrespect is a diss. Ew. The third form of diss is an abbreviation. One, discharge. Two, discount. Three, distance. All of those diss words. The next word. The next word. Now, how do they figure out? Well, we'll get to that in a second. The next word. Ew. It's diss again, but the D is capitalized. Noun from 1567, the Roman god of the underworld. And it says compared to Pluto, which might be the Greek name for dis. Um, I thought that there was, there's other, other creatures, gods, whoever they are that are in the underworld. I can't remember their names, but I don't ever remember hearing about dis. Hmm. That's interesting. And, you know, I don't think it's related in any way, obviously, to to disrespect um it's just a it's just a coincidence that maybe i don't know it's just just yeah haven't heard of the dis the roman god of the underworld dis maybe we'll put a link in the show notes for dis because i think it's always fun to uh to learn about these these old gods and goddesses what they looked like how were they represented in art and sculpture and uh and what did what did people think of them the next word, ew, it is the dis prefix. So we have three forms of the word dis, and then we have the capital D dis, so lowercase goes before capital. But I guess our prefixes with the dash at the end, do they go after the other ones? That must be. I mean, I'm sure I've seen it before, but I didn't think about it until just now. There are, must be rules of what goes first and what goes next. So the dis prefix... Um, it is, there's no year, 1A, do the opposite of, that's the definition, do the opposite of, as in, disestablish, so that's just unestablishing, you, you're, you're taking away, you're taking away the establishment of a thing, you're doing the opposite of, 1B, deprive of, and what might you be depriving of? specified quality, rank, or object, as in disfranchise, disfranchise. Mm, there are, now there, that's not the same as disenfranchise. That's a whole other thing. Hmm, I wonder if we're going to see that maybe, maybe in uh, like a week or so. Okay, 1C is exclude or expel from, as in disbar. These seem like, aren't they all kind of the same thing as do the opposite of? They were barred, and then you unbarred. It's it's still, I don't know, I feel like these, I guess that's why they're A, B, and C. They're more specific versions of kind of the same thing. I don't know, I'm not seeing like enough of a difference. I feel like you could, you could shorten it, simplify it to one thing, but whatever. I'm sure that they're specific. Again, it's like... The, the definition is made specifically for the example, and that seems kind of weird. Number two, opposite or opposite or absence of, as in disunion or disaffection. Opposite or absence of. It's all about the opposite. Number three, the whole synonym is the word not, N-O-T, just not, as in disagreeable, not agreeable. You can just replace it with that. Not agreeable, the opposite of agreeable, not agreeable. Four, completely, 
as in disannul, D-I-S-A-N-N-U-L. Disannul is completely, hmm. And then number five, it is, so the synonym is dis again, but it is spelled D-Y-S. And there's an example, which is dysfunction. So it means the D-Y-S prefix, which we won't get to learn what that means until the D-Y section. So that's going to be a while. But dysfunction is, uh, is it's different. It's, I don't know, I would, I, mean, I, th- I would think it's the, you know, the opposite of not functional. Um, and then that's just says by folk etymology, whatever that means. But the normal etymology for everything else, oh, uh, let's see, it is from the Latin dis prefix, which literally means apart. And that is akin to the Old English te prefix, t or te, which also means apart. Also from the Latin word duo, which means two, and there's more at the word two, like T-W-O, the number two. Uh, and yeah, I think the only part that makes sense there is the word apart. When I connect it to these definitions, doing the opposite of is kind of like doing something, splitting a thing apart. I don't know. It's a little bit of a stretch. The two part doesn't make any sense to me for these definitions. All right, let's talk about the last word. You. Disability, noun from 1557, 1A, the condition of being disabled. And we will see disabled in the next episode. And this, of course, brings up the whole conversation we had recently, differently abled. Um, So, you know, there's just a lot of opinions. This word has a lot of connotations depending on who you are. Do you like the word disability? Do you not like the word disability? Feel free to let me know what you think. But yes, there there are there are issues, potential issues with this word, and then of course disable, disabled. So one B is limitation in the ability to pursue an occupation because of a physical or mental impairment. Also, a program providing financial support to one affected by disability, as in, went on disability after the injury. Maybe you broke your face, and so you couldn't do your job, and so if you have insurance, you can go on disability because you cannot do your job because you have a broken face. Number two. Lack of legal qualification to do something. You are not legally qualified to do something. What thing? I don't know thing. Three, a disqualification, restriction, or disadvantage is a disability. So, uh, let's see. Restriction, disadvantage. Um, I feel like, do they use this in sports? I mean, they use the word handicap in sports, like in golf. I don't know if they use disability exactly um yeah yeah we'll talk so yeah the first couple words uh in the next episode are related to this so we can talk more about it then what were the words today we had dirty 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 bomb dirty laundry dirty old man dirty pool dirty rice dirty tricks dirty word dis 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 disability well, what are we going to pick? Um, I mean, you, well, dirty word is a good one. I don't want to pick dirty bomb, dirty laundry. No, definitely not dirty old man. We don't like dirty old people. Uh, disability is kind of interesting. Hmm, but no, nah, probably not that. Um, yeah, let's pick dirty word as the episode. The word of the episode. It is the dirty word of the episode. Um... I mean, we can sing some dirty words. Is the, would that be a fun thing to do? How many can we think of? Some dirty words are bitch, shit, piss, and fuck, and poo, and crap, and so many more that we can't think of. We just said some fun dirty words. Dirty word, dirty word, dirty, 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 dirty word, oh yeah. 
that's going to be the end of this silly episode. And then tomorrow you can listen to another silly episode. This has been Spencer Dispensing Dirty Words. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Hosted by me, Spencer. Uh, let's see. I feel like uh, the words in this episode, I am uh, not not the smartest person in the world to talk about these in any b- real great way. So, uh, you know, we'll say the definitions and then we'll just see sort of what comes out because, um, yeah, I just don't, I feel dumb is what, it's, that's what it is. I just feel dumb. Okay, the first word in this episode is disable. Disable. Able, the A is emphasized, and you can pronounce it dis or dis able. Disable, D I S A B L E. Transitive verb from the 15th century. So, this is the action that is happening of the disabling. Number one, to deprive of legal right, qualification, or capacity. Taking away those things will make you disabled. Legal right, qualification, or capacity. Hmm. Number two, to make incapable or ineffective. Incapable, can't be done. Ineffective, you're just not doing anything. Especially to deprive of physical, moral, or intellectual strength. Hmm. Wow, that, that's an interesting group of words there. Physical, moral, if you are depriving somebody, somebody or something of their moral strength, you are disabling them. I feel like I need more context for that. Uh, and then intellectual strength is the other one. That seems, I don't know, I just have issues where things are talking about People being smarter, dumber, IQ, I don't know. Your intellectual strength that makes somebody feel, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too sensitive. Um, A synonym for both definitions would be the word weaken. Disabling somebody something, weakening weakening it so it it doesn't have as much physical, moral, intellectual strength, or it's less, it's uh, more incapable or ineffective. Wait, do you say more incapable or less incapable? I feel like that's a that's hurting my brain a little bit. Uh, or also removing their legal rights, qualifications, or capacity. Disablement is a noun. I'm not even going to make another mint joke. You've heard plenty of those. I don't even know what a disablement would be. You eat the mint and then you can't talk for 20 minutes because it's so spicy or strong? All right, we have to move on to the next word. Froom. I guess that will be the sound effect. The next word is disabled. Adjective from 1633. Incapacitated by illness or injury. So are there other options? Are there are there are there other things that can can affect you in this way? Illness or injury? I I can't even think of, I feel like there should be something else though. I mean, I feel like if you're just born a certain way that one would call disabled, uh, for example, you're missing an arm, people may call that disabled, that that's not necessarily illness or injury. If you were just born that way, that's just genetics. So I feel like, but maybe, maybe this next part is going to explain this a bit more because there's also... Physically or mentally impaired in a way that substantially limits activity, especially in relation to employment or education. So if it is harder for you to get a job, hold a job, be good at a job, or some or learn, I guess, education, learning things in, a, in whatever way that means, uh, then you would be considered disabled. And yeah, we talked about this a bit before last episode and before that. Um, you know, how do you feel about this word? This is, um, some people have issues with it. Some people don't mind it. I think it depends on what sort of impairment, uh, physical or mental impairment they have. Uh, you know, I, I am I'm not in, I'm not a fan. I'm not in the camp of 
uh, putting putting somebody down, you know, I feel like we all ha- we just have to look at everybody as equals. And so it could have potentially some negative connotation to this word. Uh, but that that's uh, that's uh, up to the beholder, I guess. Right. It's in the view, in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, there's a whole lot, whole big discussion about that word. But we don't need to get into it because I'm just one person and you need to hear from all the other people. So the next word, froom, disabuse. Now, at first I thought it was disabuse, but it is disabuse because it is a transitive verb from circa 1611 to free from error, fallacy, or misconception. To free from error. So basically it's like it's it's perfect. There's no misconceptions about it. It's all true. It's all great because it's disabuse. Uh, this is French from Desabuser. I don't know if I said my fake French accent correctly or not. Desabuser, uh, which is from dis plus abuser, which means to abuse, to free from misconception, fallacy, or error. Froom. Disaccharidase. Is that how you say this word? Disaccharidase? I think so, or disaccharides, D-I-S-A-C-C-H-A-R-I-D-A-S-E, noun from 1961. Now, I think the next word might help if we read it first, but that's not how we do things around here, so we're going to go a little out of order. It is, so the disaccharidase is an enzyme as a maltase or lactase that hydrolyzes disaccharides. So this enzyme hydrolyzes disaccharides, which are vroom, a noun from 1881. Disaccharide. It's, that's the word. That's this word. Any of a class of sugars like sucrose that yields on hydrolysis two monosaccharide molecules. It yields two monosaccharide molecules on on hydrolysis, I think that's what it said. That's a weird phrase, but I guess that's what it does. And I've heard of these things, all of these enzymes and sugars and proteins, and I just never fully studied it. So my brain is sort of like, there's so many words and it's complicated, and I'm sure it's not that complicated, but it's very, it's a whole lot of information. Something about sugars. I don't know. We break down sugars. I'm trying to cut down on my sugar. You should too. We all should just be limited, limited in our sugar. Fruits are fine. A little bit of thing, moderation now and then. It's fine. But, you know, we, we don't want to overdo it with these things. Vroom. The next word is disaccord. Disaccord. Intransitive verb from the 15th century. Synonyms are clash and disagree, and disaccord is also a noun. So if you, there is some sort of clash, if people are, people or communities or countries are disagreeing on a thing, that they're having a clash, they're clashing. It's not their clothes clashing, it's their viewpoints clashing probably, and they are having a disaccord. Although, if somebody is wearing clothes that clash, and you look at them, then maybe your brain will have a disaccord because it's like, I can't comprehend what's going on with your clothes. Uh, This is from Anglo-French disaccord, which means disagreement. Uh, And then, of course, it's the opposite of accord. I I don't remember what we read for that. We just read the definition because then we add the dis here and it's the opposite of accord. Accord, it's like when you're all, it's like when you're playing the accordion and everything is happy and great. Uh, vroom, disaccustom, transitive verb from 1530, to free from a habit. When you have a habit, you are accustomed to it. It is a custom in your life. It's part of your customs. And if you would put the dis on, disaccustom, it's, you're getting rid of that habit. Maybe it's a cigarette habit. I think we should disaccustom ourselves from, from the cigarettes. I wonder what the trend has been like of cigarette usage over the last hundred years. I would like to think it's probably going down, but I'm not sure. The next word, vroom, 
it's, it became, it's a, it's a car sound of some kind. Disadvantage, first form, noun from the 14th century. Number one, loss or damage, especially to reputation, credit, or finances. Uh, if you have an, uh, if you have finances, that's an advantage. Uh, but if you have lose them, if they have gone missing, you've lost them. Uh, then it's, you're in a disadvantage from where you were. Maybe uh, the synonym is detriment, as in the deal worked to their disadvantage, which means it did not work to their advantage. It was not helpful to them in any way. Isn't it funny how something can work to the opposite of a th- of the thing? It's I don't know. It's just a funny way to phrase that. the The deal worked to their disadvantage. I don't feel like you usually say that. Don't we usually say the deal worked to your advantage? Yeah, I mean, you could say it either way. It's fine. Two a, an unfavorable, inferior, or prejudicial condition, as in we were at a disadvantage. That is a very unfavorable, inferior, or prejudicial condition that we are in. To be a quality or circumstance that makes achievement unusually difficult. Un- it's so unusual how difficult it is. The synonym is the word handicap. Mm. That makes achievement unusually well, let's see. I mean, yes, I guess if you, if you, well, this is sort of, you know, like disabled, disabled. If there's something, some situation that you're in, uh, that you're, yeah, I mean, there must be, a, what's the difference between handicap and disabled? A handicap is just a thing that's gonna, hmm, they are similar. I don't know. I can't really put my, put my finger on it because I'm not even sure what, what, what the difference is. I just like how it says, it makes achievement unusually difficult as in the example his lack of formal schooling was a serious disadvantage it uh so his school was very informal or he didn't go to school i guess i guess uh, yeah if you're not going to learn as much or uh, if you're trying to go to another school not having formal schooling will be a disadvantage hmm yeah, the, the the etymology is pretty clear. Vroom. Disadvantage, second form. Transitive verb from circa 1534. To place at a disadvantage. And the synonym is harm. Going to harm you, put you into a disadvantaged situation. Oh, that's the next word. Vroom. Disadvantaged. Adjective from 1879. Lacking in the basic resources or conditions believed to be necessary for an equal position in society. And examples of these uh, conditions, resources, resources or conditions that you are lacking in would be standard housing, medical and educational facilities, and also civil rights. Yes, if you do not have those things, you are in a disadvantaged situation and there are lots and lots of people who should not be in disadvantaged situations because of things that they usually cannot control. So, so there's so many things. Like, just where you grow up, first of all, is a big one. The color of your skin is a big one. Those are just two that sort of just jump right out at me. And, uh, yeah, just, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, B, I believe you should not have to be in a position of being disadvantaged just because of those things. Or anything, probably. Disadvantagedness is a long word and a noun. From. Disadvantageous is next. Disadvantageous. Adjective from 1603. One, constituting a disadvantage. Two, Synonyms are derogatory and disparaging. Derogatory and disparaging is disadvantageous. Disadvantageously is an adverb, and disadvantageousness is a noun. And can you say disadvantageousnessless? I don't know. Vroom. The next word 
is disaffect, transitive verb from 1635, to alienate the affection or loyalty of, to alienate the affection or so is somebody somebody has affection or loyalty to you and then you alienate that for some reason. Also, to fill with discontent and unrest. Hmm. Um, a synonym for all is the word estrange. So I guess yes, if you if you are estranged from your family who maybe have affection or loyalty to you, uh, then you are alienating them. Uh, but the, the second one's a little bit more confusing. To fill with discontent and unrest. Are you filling yourself up with discontent and unrest or somebody else with discontent and unrest? Probably yourself. If you're, you know, I hear the phrase like disaffected youth or something like that. Um... You are, I guess, if you are disaffected, which is our next word, maybe you have discontent and unrest about the situation of the world and your life and other things. Disaffection is a noun. So, what does disaffected mean? It is an adjective from 1632. Discontented and resentful... Those are, well, one of the words, discontented and resentful, especially against authority. And the synonym is rebellious. As in, here's the phrase, I didn't even read it here, disaffected youth. Usually, it's the youths who are disaffected because there's there's nothing but authority to them, basically. They are not in a position of authority and they're probably not super happy about the way that the older authoritative people are running things. And so, uh, you know, if it weren't for disaffected youth, we w- we wouldn't change as a culture ever. Uh, yeah, I think I think that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, you know, be 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 the part of the rebellion, be rebellious. If there are things that you got issues with, you know, there's a, there's always something. You, there's change. Progress is always happening. So, yeah. The next word, vroom, disaffiliate, disaffiliate, transitive, uh, well, it's a verb, from circa 1870, starting with transitive, which is the synonym disassociate, disassociate, and uh, that word must be coming up in a couple of episodes, yes, yes. So this word is disaffiliate. You are disassociating yourself from a thing, disaffiliating yourself. You are not associated or affiliated with that club anymore, so you have disaffiliated yourself. Intransitive verb is to terminate an affiliation. Yeah, same idea. Disaffiliation is a noun. Next. (sighs) Disaffirm. Transitive verb from 1531, one, to refuse, to confirm. I will not confirm. I refuse to confirm. I have disaffirmed. Uh, The synonyms are annul and repudiate. Yeah, I guess affirm and confirm can basically mean the same thing. Number two, this synonym is contradict. Disaffirmance? Disaffirmance, that is a noun. (laughs) <laughs> Let's move on to vroom. Disaggregate. Disaggregate. D-I-S-A-G-G-R-E-G-A-T-E. Transitive. It's a verb again. I They got me again. Verb. Circa 1828. Starting with transitive. To separate into component parts. Parts. As in disaggregate. sandstone or it's actually disaggregate sandstone because that's the verb so you are disaggregating sandstone by separating its its parts the components parts also is in disaggregate demographic data separating it out intransitive is to break up or apart as in the molecules of a gel disaggregate to form a soul, S-O-L. 
what is a soul? Is it similar to a gel? I've heard soul in terms of like the sun, and I think on Mars, one soul is one day. Um, but I don't know what this soul is. I'm super intrigued. I feel like I got to put a link in the show notes or something. Is it is it similar to a gel? The molecules of a gel disaggregate to form a soul. Disaggregation is a noun, and disaggregative, disaggregative is an adjective. There's one more for this episode. <sighs> Disagree, D-I-S-A-G-R-E-E. This one is a an intransitive verb from the 15th century. One, to fail to agree. As in, the two accounts disagree. They, there, there has been a failure in the agreeing. Oh, oh no, there's a, there's a failure. Our agreement is broken. It has failed. We, we have a disagreement. Number two, to differ in opinion. As in, he disagreed. He disagreed with me on every topic. Well, then move on or have a conversation about why you disagree about everything there is there are there any people who disagree on literally every topic three to cause discomfort or distress as in fried foods disagree with me i had there was one night many years ago where i had way too much fried food and i did not feel good a little bit, a tiny little bit on occasion is okay, but boy, you can't have too much. It's, it's a treat. It's a treat. Treat it like a treat. Treat yourself for some fried food, because otherwise it might disagree with your system, and it's not going to be happy with you. You you and your system will differ in opinion on whether or not you should have eaten those fried foods. You don't agree. There has been a failure in the green. Replace the fried food with some healthy veggies, with some tasty dips. Okay, the uh, you know that was the last word. Um, anything else to say about disagree? Uh, don't ever disagree with me. You will not uh, like that. Uh, no, I think it is good. It is good for people to disagree because uh, everybody has different perspectives and viewpoints, and so uh, it's just going to happen. And I think that the trick, the thing to do is to uh, just sort of figure out, well, how you can be cool, even if you disagree, or maybe you can come to a compromise about what you disagree with. Um, but, you know, I think not uh, not getting getting mad, you know, and this, this has to do with anything, uh, a stranger, a person you know, or whatever. Um, get, uh, don't get mad, don't, don't start a fight because you disagree uh just 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 be cool be cool man that's all just be cool okay we have to reread the words and then we have to pick one as the word of the episode so we had disable disabled disabuse disaccharidase disaccharide disaccord disaccustom disadvantage disadvantage disadvantaged disadvantageous Disaffect, disaffected, disaffiliate, disaffirm, disaggregate, and disagree. Had to really concentrate to say all those words. Ooh, okay. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Well, um, I'm just looking through the words. I mean, disagree, I feel like, you know, if you really think about it, that's a, that's a pretty big word. L lots of problems have come up because people disagreed. Hmm, 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 looking through. Yeah, we'll just pick that. Disagree, don't you disagree with me. It's okay, you can disagree with me. Disagree, disagree, we have lots of people who disagree on this planet. And that's a fact. Okay, that was that. Uh, you know, the songs are just fine. They're it's not always great, but they, they say a little something maybe, and uh, there's a little tune to them, and that's all we need in this life. So, I'm going to end this episode. Oh, yes, maybe I'll say that in the next one. And uh, thank you for turning this on. I hope you have enjoyed it very much. And uh, come back next time, where it will yet again be Spencer reading the dictionary. This has been Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. 
Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hosted by Spencer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the first word in this episode is disagreeable. This word does not agree with me. It is an adjective from the 15th century. Number one, causing discomfort, like fried foods. And the synonyms are unpleasant and offensive, as in a disagreeable odor. It's a good thing this podcast has no smell vision Number two, marked by ill temper, and the synonym is peevish, as in a disagreeable person. Oh, they have ill temper, that person. I'm going to stay away from that ill temper. Disagreeableness is a noun. Disagreeably is an adverb. Hmm, disagreeable. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to say about this word. We talked a lot about disagree in the last episode. I did. And uh, yeah, ill temper, causing discomfort. Um, I don't like it when I'm in uncomfortable situations. I don't agree with being in this situ- this uncomfortable situation. Okay, we need to move on to the next word, which is... Fwee! Disagreement. Noun from the 15th century. Number one, the act of disagreeing. We disagree. We are in a disagreement. Number two, to A, the state of being at variance. And the synonym is disparity. I feel like that might be in the math world. A state of being in variance seems seems like that would be mathy kind of related, right? Things that are disparity, they're in a state of disagreement. To be, the synonym is quarrel. When you disagree, you might have a little quarrel. I think this, you think that. Let's quarrel about it. Okay, next word. Whee! Disallow. Transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to deny the force, truth, or validity of. But it has. It's valid and it has truth and a force to be reckoned with. You are going to disallow it to exist? Number two. To refuse to allow. I will not allow you to not rate this podcast. Disallowance is a noun. Next. Whew. Disambiguate. Disambiguate. Okay. It is a transitive verb from 1963 to establish a single semantic or grammatical interpretation for. To establish a single semantic or grammatical interpretation for. Uh, You are getting rid of any sort of ambiguation about uh, this single semantic or grammatical interpretation. People have interpreted it. I'm not coming up with an example, but I'm just saying. People have interpreted this uh, semantic or grammatical thing in various ways, but you are uh, you're you're putting your foot down, and there's no more ambiguation. It's not it's not ambiguate. It's not ambiguous. Yeah, but I'm sure this is for a very specific situation that I'm not aware of. Disambiguation is a noun. Next, <laughs> disannul. D-I-S-A-N-N-U-L. Transitive verb from the 15th century. Now, the synonyms are annul and cancel. So how and why are annul and disannul the same thing? It's funny because the word annul is kind of like the prefix dis, where you're making it like the opposite of. Right? Where, where did we have the peers, the prefix dis? Uh, deprive of, do the opposite of. So, yeah, annul is kind of already just like that. So if it's like a disannul is a double annulment, 
but it's the same thing. It's like well, you don't even need the dis prefix at all. That's a that's a fun way to think about that. Whoo! Disappear. Disappear. Verb from the 15th century, number one for intransitive. To pass from view. Pass from view? So you just you can't be seen. Oh, I feel like this is a very old way to say this. To pass from view? I don't know what that means. I would think something is passing through your view. I think what it probably means is you're not, it's not in view anymore. So I don't know. I just feel like that needs to be updated to be just more clear and literal for people who are like me and not so old and smart. I mean, I am old, not that old. Number two, to cease to be. Also, pass out of existence or notice. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Nobody noticed that it used to exist. It's just gone. Uh, Now here's transitive. To cause the disappearance of. So you're making a thing disappear or you are being disappeared. So in the transitive, you are making something else disappear. Like if I eat the food, it has disappeared because it has passed from your view. Or the intransitive is when the thing itself is disappearing. Disappearance is a noun. Uh, Maybe, maybe if I feel like it, I will put a very silly old video in the show notes of myself trying to make myself disappear at about four or five years old. Um, Let's see. My dad showed us how we could make magic on these on old cameras where he stops the camera and then we do a thing, we change a thing, and, you know, it was like in-camera editing. And I didn't fully understand the concept because I was young. Let's just use that as an excuse. And uh, I don't know. I, it was always just very... I just looked at myself as a very dumb kid when I saw myself try to make myself disappear. It didn't quite work out. That's the spoiler. The next word, phew, disappoint, I think. Okay, verb from the 15th century. Um, We are starting with transitive, to fail to meet the expectation or hope of. The synonym is frustrate. Nobody wants to do this. I don't want to be to disappoint people. I want to meet the expectations that they have hoped of me. And so they are not frustrated and I can provide exactly what they were looking for. I don't I want to I want to be an appoint. I want to appoint and not disappoint. As in the team disappointed its fans. Well, you know, maybe they were just having a bad day. Deal with it. Intransitive is to cause disappointment. As in, where the show disappoints most is in the work of the younger generation. Ooh, that is a a, a sick burn and not a good one. That is a quote. If you are unhappy with what was said there, you can uh, contact John Ashbery. The show disappoints in the work of the younger generation. Let's see, does the etymology say, it says Middle English disappointen, which means to dispossess from dis plus appointer, which means to arrange, and there's more at the word appoint. I'm sure there is. Oh, I just hate it when I disappoint. The next word, disappointed, adjective from 1537, One, defeated in expectation or hope. Number two is obsolete, not adequately equipped. You are not appointed correctly to do the thing. You are not adequately equipped. You are disappointed. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, I think, more, obviously, a more older way to use these words, which um, it's just interesting to think about how it went from not being appointed to 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 this other thing to disappointing to mm, interesting disappointedly is an adverb next Whew! disappointing adjective from 1530 
failing to meet expectations, as in a disappointing meal. I am uh, I'm very not picky when it comes to food, so I haven't really had a many many or any disappointing meals, um, unless maybe the maybe the um, the people I'm with, yeah, the company that could make it a disappointing meal. But if it's uh, food, if it's edible, I'm going to be fine with that. Disappointingly is an adverb. And the thing that I hope I am not, but I wouldn't be surprised if I was with this kind of podcast. Also, nobody wants to hear this. Phew! Disappointment. Noun from 1604. Uh, we just watched a show yesterday where somebody said, some parents said that they were disappointed in somebody, I think. And then um, the, oh, there's also this very classic uh, story from uh, Steve-O from Jackass. And he he just told this story about how it's so much worse when your parent says that they're disappointed in you instead of being mad at you Um and of course, it, it, it was they were talking about one of their ridiculous stunts, so that's not important. But, you know, I'll never forget how he was like, yeah, my dad said that if I did that thing, he would have been really disappointed in me and that, so I chose not to do it, <laughs> which is funny coming from Steve-O of all people. Okay, number one for disappointment, the act or an instance of disappointing, the state or emotion of being disappointed. Number two, one that disappoints, as in, he's a disappointment to his parents. He's got to get his shit together, man. The next word. Whew! Disapprobation. Disapprobation. Noun from 1647. The act or state of disapproving. Also, the state of being disapproved. We're going to talk about that in a second. Disapproved. The synonym is condemnation. So if somebody is disapproving in you and you have been a big disappointment, then they are condemning you. They they are in a state of disapprobation. Or maybe you're in the state of disapprobation. Which one is it? Is it both? The actor state of disapproving. So if you are disapproving of a thing, you are in disapprobation. But the state of being disapproved, the thing itself, the person, the whoever it is, the whatever, the meal, the people, the things, those, that can be also in a disapprobation. The next word. Disapproval. Noun from 1662. The synonyms are disapprobation and also censure. C-E-N-S-U-R-E. Censure. If you disapprove of something, you might try to censor it. There are lots of people who are trying to censor what people say, or things in movies, or things like that, or books. They disapprove of them. Why? Because, oh, who God, we, we don't even go into why. So many reasons why they might disapprove of those things. But, um... We, I don't like the idea of censoring. The next word, whew, disapprove. Tra- verb from 1614, starting with transitive. One, to pass unfavorable judgment on. Un, so the judgment that you are passing on, is it's not, it's not favorable. It's not good judgment. The person wouldn't want to be judged this way. It's unfavorable. It's not your favorite. Hmm, number two. To refuse approval to. The synonym is reject. Reject. I disapprove of what whatever you sent me. I disapprove of it. I don't like it. I'm going to reject it. If you send me an email, though, or maybe a voicemail, uh, I probably won't reject it. Let's see what happens. I mean, I may, I will, it depends, we'll see. If somebody sends me something, we'll see if I reject it. If I like it, I'll put it, I'll talk about it, I'll put it in uh, an episode. Intransitive, for disapprove, to feel or express disapproval. Disapprover 
is a noun and disapprovingly is an adverb. Okay, just a few more words. Woo! Disarm. 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 You can emphasize either syllable and say dis or dis. Disarm. Verb from the 14th century, 1A. To deprive of means, reason, or disposition to be hostile, as in disarmed criticism by admitting her errors. Aha, so you can just admit your errors and then you won't be criticized for them? Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, in that case, let me tell you about my errors. There are lots. One, one B is to win over, to disarm, to win over. You have, you have gotten rid of their arms, yanked them out of their shoulder sockets, and then you uh, then you then they can't stop you, so you've won them over. They've been disarmed. 2A, to divest of arms. So you if you invest in things, you are... Hmm, how do you say... What do you say for that? Divest opposed to invest. I mean, we will get to the word divest soon, so we'll get a, a real definition, uh, you know, before the Ds are done. Uh, but yeah, you're, basically you're just getting rid of arms. As in the example, disarm captured troops. Now, these are not the arms that are coming from your body. These are the arms like the weapons. So if you're getting rid of the weapons uh, of these captured troops, you don't want the captured troops to have weapons. That's, that's not very smart, because unless you want a fair fight. But if you've captured them, then uh, yeah, you should probably disarm them. To be... To deprive of a means of attack or decline. No. To deprive of a means of attack or defense, as in disarm a ship. It has no way to attack or defend itself if you disarm it. Disarm a ship. To see. To make harmless, as in disarm a bomb. Oh, how many scenes in movies have we seen where people are trying to disarm a bomb? Countless. Countless. If you want to, please edit together all of the disarming a bomb scenes. That would be fun to watch. It is now harmless. To make harmless. Intransitive. One. To lay aside arms. Just going to lay them gently on the ground because they are weapons and they might go off if I am not gentle with them. Two, to give up or reduce armed forces. We are reducing our armed forces or giving them up altogether disarmed. They are armed forces because they are armed with weapons. Disarmament is a noun and disarmor is also a noun. The etymology is from Middle English desarmin, which literally means to divest of arms. Yep, see, it's all, it's just, it's right there in the word, the arms, and you're getting rid of them. Whoop! Disarming. Adjective from 1839. Elaine, criticism or hostility. And is that the proper way to say that word? Allay or allay? I feel like it's allay. Um, Elaine, criticism or hostility. You're, you're sort of chilling it down, getting rid of it. You're saying, nope, no criticism or hostility here. I'm going to disarm all of that. The synonym is ingratiating, as in a disarming smile. Hmm. How do you describe ingratiating? It's like opening to, sort of pulling them into your world. Um, hmm. Ingratiate yourself with the people. I don't know, make them like you. Uh, there's lots of ways I'm sure that you could describe that. I don't think I have a disarming smile. I don't know. What, what, what is a disarming smile? It makes people want to talk to you? Disarmingly is an adverb. Foo! Disarrange. 
transitive verb from 1744 to disturb the arrangement or order of, as in hair, disarranged by the wind. Ah, I arranged my hair so precisely you have, you, you wind, I, it, you, you disarranged my hair all, all up in the wind, and now I am very, I am very, uh, I am disapproving of what you did. That has, that was a big disappointment to me. Um, disarrangement is a noun. The next word. Disarray. First form, noun from the 15th century. One, a lack of order or sequence. The synonyms are confusion and disorder, as in, the room was in disarray. What did you do here? How did the room get this way? I don't even understand. There's there's more things in it now than there was before. You brought things in and disarrayed them in the room? Number two, disorderly dress. Uh, the synonym is, oh, we had this recently, or we haven't yet. Dishabille. Dishabille. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see that uh, later. Later. Dishabille, uh, disorderly dress, disarray. Your clothes are in disarray. Foo! The next word is the second form of disarray. Transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to throw into disorder. I'm going to just toss it over there in the disorder pile, which is all ordered into one pile. Number two, the synonym is undress. Disarray is undress. I guess if you are undressing, you are getting in a state of disarray because all of your clothes, which were arranged very nicely on your body, are now arrayed not anymore. Next word. Whoop. Disarticulate. Disarticulate. This is uh, a verb from 1830 starting with intransitive. To become disjointed. And transitive, the synonym is disjoint. So disjoint or become disjointed. And disarticulation is a noun. Hmm. If you... So to become disjoint, disjoint, you... Well, I, I automatically think of a, a, like a stop motion skeleton puppet because it can articulate, you can move the, the arms around, um, and they are made of joints, but if you unjoint them, then they cannot articulate anymore. Uh, but that's probably not the best example. That's just where my brain goes. Uh, okay, we have one more word. Woo! Disassemble. D-I-S-A-S. S-E-M-B-L-E. Um, it is a verb from 1903. And, of course, I want to say, Avengers, disassemble. Uh, starting with transitive, to take apart, as in, disassemble a watch. Well, I hope it's broken, because you're either taking it apart to see how it works, and maybe you're going to try and put it back together again, or maybe you know how to fix it, so you are disassembling it so you can fix it. Or maybe you're going to take it apart and make some cool art with it, so other people can enjoy it, even because it doesn't work anymore. Intransitive number one, to come apart, as in, the frame disassembles into sections. Oh, well, that's very nice that they designed the frame that way. I can take it apart and travel along with it. Number two, the synonyms are disperse and scatter, as in, the crowd began to disassemble. Why? Why? Disassembly is a noun. Alrighty righty doody doody it's time to reread the wordies. We had disagreeable, disagreement, disallow, disambiguate, disannul, disappear, disappoint, disappointed, disappointing, disappointment, 
disapprobation, disapproval, disapprove, disarm, disarming, disarrange, disarray, disarray, disarticulate, and disassemble. Oh, my eyes kind of hurt from reading all of those words. Um, well, ooh, disarm, that is a good one. That is a good one. I like disappear. I liked uh, disannul because it also just means annul. And that's confusing. Oh, let's see. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe, maybe we'll pick disarm just from a, you know, political, foreign relations kind of more peace and love instead of war kind of viewpoint. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll pick disarm. Disarm everybody, disarm. We don't need no arms. We just need legs. That is going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I will say um, I have a couple of uh, potential projects coming up. I don't have anything real um, solid to say, but if and when that happens, which most likely it will, um, I will, I will mention them to you if, and these would, would be, I will mention them if these are things that you can watch in some capacity, which, or attend or something. Anyway, we'll see what happens. I am, uh, I'm excited about them and I think they are very fun and silly. If you like the silly, I'll let you know. Okay. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.